We got a lot going on in the economy. There's politics. There's uh, uh, warnings from certain individuals that the political crisis we're seeing with Donald Trump and with the upcoming election could be bad for the economy because it could have an effect on confidence. I'm not so sure about that. That seems a bit vague and, and nebulous. But there's also other concerns about student loan debt. And there's a lot that we can talk about. So we're hanging out with Meet Kevin. Thank uh, you. Who are you? What do you do? <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. Uh, I, uh, Is the camera not working? Oh, okay. Very well. <laughs> hey, oh, there right. it is. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, maybe maybe I bumped into it on the way in. Sorry about that. It's it's been a rocky economy. There we go. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, so I'm a, I'm a financial advisor. I uh, make finance videos on YouTube. I cover stocks and real estate. I started in real estate, real estate broker, licensed lender, licensed contractor. Kind of done a little bit of everything. <laughs> so, you were you were like running for governor too, or something, right? I ran for governor in California. Yeah, that state needs a lot of help. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I actually it resonate a lot with. I can't remember when you said this. It might have been a while ago that you said it. But this this idea of like everybody sort of told me, Kevin, leave the Democratic Party. You're not a Democrat or whatever. And I'm like, I'm just. I feel like I'm a centrist, and California needs to change. So as soon as they hear D, they're like, Oh, I I can't be friends with you because you have that label. I'm like, I'm just a human. <laughs> you yeah, know? That's, that, that's interesting. When uh, when all that stuff was going on, I remember everybody was shouting you out, saying like, You could actually. This is the guy. Meet Kevin. Could be the saving grace of, of California because you're a centrist, because you're reasonable, because you're honest and running as a Democrat, you actually have a chance to win. You, just, you could get nothing done if you were a Republican in California. You know, people look back to Schwarzenegger, but back then, Democrats didn't have a supermajority control of the legislature. Today, they control about 80% of the legislature in California. So if you got a Republican in, they'd just sandbag you for the two, four, six years, whatever you got lucky enough to sit wow. in there for. So how, how did that end up turning out? I mean, you did you, did you do decently well? Yeah, so uh, it was a recall election. So voters had to vote on whether or not to recall the governor. And it was actually looking like they were going to go for voting for recalling him. And the next right. best option would have been, in my opinion, myself. I was the <laughs> only one on the Democratic ticket running uh, until you had on the Republican side, Larry Elder come in, who very powerful force on uh, on the Republican ticket. Uh, he ended up getting first place out of recall candidates. I came in second. Uh, so I beat all the other candidates. Uh, but uh, what the Democrats were able to do was brand Larry Elder as being to the right of Trump. And as soon and as a they white said, supremacist, yes. And as <laughs> soon as they did that and said, you know, uh, lockdowns are coming back and, and what he's going to, you know, um, uh, what was it? Larry Elder was going to kill your children. That's what it was, because he was going to take away masks and uh, tell everybody they don't need to get vaccinated. And uh, that actually then motivated Californians to come out and vote wow. to keep Newsom. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Man, pretty that's, wild. That's 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 so awful. But yeah. I mean, you know, knowing everything that's going on in politics, I mean, you still consider yourself a Democrat? Oh man, I, I don't even know what to consider myself anymore. I really I consider myself first and foremost an American, which I feel proud to say because I was born in Germany. Yeah. I'm an immigrant. And uh I, How, when, when 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 was that? When, like when did you birth? I was like born? thirteen months old. I was born in ninety two. Oh okay. Uh so and what's crazy is, you know, as much as you can believe it, but the Wall Street Journal just did a piece where they showed a chart of hate of how much Democrats hate Republicans and how much Republicans hate uh, Democrats. Wall Street Journal? Wall Street Journal, they published it within the last week. Uh, I actually tweeted a, a screenshot of it uh, probably within the last week, but it's a chart of hate from the early 90s and it shows how hate for the other party has basically just gone straight up like if if that could be a stock i've invested in in the last 30 years <laughs> it would be fantastic because i'm 31 now uh just because of how much hate has accelerated for the other party part of it they blame on maybe ignorance for the other people part of it they blame on you know media and and whatever um you know extremism for views whatever it might be but um, it's it's pretty wild uh, how much divisiveness there's, you know. I'm trying to find your your tweet. Yeah, let's see. I'll I'll try to help you find it as well. I'll, how long um, ago was it? Oh, it should have been within the last week, and uh, we talked about how how sad it really was. I'm gonna just hit media. Maybe that'll. Uh, oh, here we go. You got it. Yep. Wow, look there at this. It is. Yeah, look at that. See, if that was a stock I could invest in, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you could invest in, hey, uh, you can though. <laughs> well, I, but you, I mean, yeah. there there are smart financial people who can look yeah. at that, yeah. figure out what is economically tied to the <sighs> this political space. And I got to be honest, media is the obvious one yeah. because yeah. Democrats and Republicans are about to dump billions yeah. into media markets for advertising because they hate each other. That's a good point. All the super PACs. Oh yeah. When uh, 
Yeah, when uh, Bloom, when, when was Bloomberg? Was that was that like 2019, 2020? Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, Michael Bloomberg. Oh yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah. I mean, he put in half a billion dollars. Oh my god! So we're That's we're insane. yeah, we're getting all these ads. So I'm just like, there's there's one of your targets. Well, Media even markets. in L.A., you had the uh, L.A. mayoral race just this uh, you know last election cycle, and the amount of money that was spent for a mayoral race. I mean, it, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred million dollars, and it's just insane. Maybe even more than that. But you've, you're now getting these rich billionaires who are like, okay, we got to buy as much as we can, and they're spending a lot of money on messaging and marketing. It's it's uh, it's pretty incredible. Here, here, here we go. I think this yeah. is it. This is is this the article? The that looks tribalism right. Tribalism took over our politics. Yes. Yeah. Jason. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's a good writer. Yeah. There it is. Wow. Uh, Wow, we missed this one. This was a week ago. This is like right up our alley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, share of those in each party who view the other party very favorably. Oh, I'm sorry, unfavorably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sixty-two <laughs> percent of Republicans. Like it's a, it's almost an all-time high. Mm -hmm. Wow, 1994 was yeah. 21. Now it's 62. Yeah. Look at that. Democrats in 95 really did not like Republicans, mm -hmm. and that's interesting that that Democrats don't. This this is surprising me. Democrats, it's 54 percent unfavorability, but. That's lower than Republicans. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is probably what we see in the culture war. Mm -hmm. The You've woke. Got, yeah. You yeah. know, drag shows and things like that are really, um, I don't know what's the right word, astringent, I guess, to the, yeah. to the conservative mind. Yeah. And that's resulting in escalating anger. But I also think, too, what we're seeing with the, you know, the, the politics, the indictment of Trump and all that stuff yes. is really making people angry. Plus, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talked about this last night. They just sentenced one of the Proud Boys or two of them yeah. to 17 you know, years, 17 for Joe Biggs. And then the other guy got 15. Wow. Uh, I think his name was Jordan Rail or something like that. And that is insanely excessive. The theory that uh, many uh, a theory that many, many uh, Trump supporters are putting forward is that they're intentionally trying to agitate and piss off Republicans and conservatives and Trump supporters oh, wow. to escalate the the political conf conflict uh, which i think is the natural consequence of what we're seeing politically this this article actually i think it's the nail on the head of the hammer all that's going to happen is people are going to hate each other more and more and more yeah you know what, what i was saying is if you're a republican politician and you see something like this you know your path to victory is going to be a retribution revenge ticket so then this Repo you know, you're going to get a politician coming out and saying, "Vote for me, and I'll go after them." Yeah, no Democrats kidding. will do the same thing. And it's very interesting you say that uh, that observation that you had about Democrats actually becoming almost less unfavorable of Republicans. It almost looks like that. I wonder if how far that time goes on the right. But I wonder how much of that aligns with uh, the indictments of Trump. Because one thing right. that I have noticed is, at least on my channel, which I've always thought was very 50-50, uh, I've noticed a lot of Democrats leaving comments when I make a Trump video saying, look, I'm, I'm a Democrat, people will say, but what they're doing to Trump is not okay. And it, yeah. it scares me. And, and I think that's very interesting that you're almost seeing that bridge, that crossover of like, let the voters decide is what people are saying. It seems that way. Yeah, I agree. I just, I think the, the one, yeah. if you look at the G, the Georgia indictments with like uh, Fonnie Willis, I think this is exactly it. This is the, my constituents hate Trump so much, yeah. I get reelected yep. and I make money if I target him. So it's not about the law. Get Trump. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then the response from the right is going to is, is we're now hearing all the uh, Trump supporters and conservatives say, do something to members of Congress, yeah. which means come 2024, when it when or uh, even even now ish, you'll start seeing people who are going to be running for primaries for a congressional ticket. And they're going to be campaigning on. I will file subpoenas. I will issue criminal referrals and we will go after them. Right. Neither side, I think. I, both both sides think they're justified. I think my view of it is is more the indictments against Trump are obviously an overreach of the law yeah. for political power. Oh, yeah. The right, the conservative side, the Republicans aren't really doing much. They're saying we want to have an inquiry and have a special session right. to question the, the prosecutor. So you're going to get a reaction from Republicans. Sure. What do you think about Vivek's take? Pardon Trump, put it in the past, move on. Well, yeah, I think Vivek's fantastic. Yeah. Uh his, his perspective, of course, is more aligned with what I think is the truth in that. That's his campaign slogan. Yeah, right. You know, and I, and I do find him to be a very honest guy. Everyone keeps trying to get him with sure, like past sure, statements. Sure. And then he yeah. comes out and he just addresses all of them like right. bang, bang, bang. And it's, I, I like the guy. I don't think he's perfect. I, no, recall, I mean, nobody you know. is. I, I mean, I have some complaints about his his pharmacy past myself. But right. in terms of if I if I separate the past uh, and the, the what he's saying now about the future, 
it's it very much resonates with what Americans are looking for in a politician. I, I agree. And, and I think he addresses the concerns and the things in the past. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, yeah. I, you couldn't get a better answer out of the guy. He's he's. He's he's not making mistakes. He's a couple. Yeah, they oh, yeah. got they got him on that nine eleven thing, which was oh, hilarious. Gosh, I know, but he, you know, <laughs> all of those things. I think you almost need to hit those landmines when you're running for office because it gets you in the attention right. cycles. Yep, and it just helps you in the polls. I mean, strangely, the prediction markets have him down. He, yeah, he, that he, is true. After the debates, I will say, after the debate, after Trump skipped the uh, debate and went for Tucker, uh, and which I don't blame. I thought that was a really kind of funny slam at Fox. <laughs> it yes. was like the perfect timing of that. But uh, I thought after Trump's performance there where he felt a little beaten up, which you can't blame him with all the stuff he's been dealing with. He felt a little beaten up on Tucker and Vivek's performance. I would have expected more of a uh, a, a fall in Trump polling and a rise in Vivek didn't happen. If anything, Trump became more popular. Yeah, Trump went yeah. up. Ron actually yeah. went up and down. Uh, yeah. It was, it was really weird. During the debate, Vivek drops. Yeah. Afterwards, he skyrockets. Right. And now he's down again. I know. It's, just, it's so weird. It's polling, though. You know? Yeah. Well, the, 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 prediction, <laughs> the prediction markets are people making bets. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. I'm wondering. Now, Nikki that's Haley true. is true. almost in, in third place. Yeah, that's right. You like looking at predicted. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've actually and interviewed that CEO when I was running for governor. I had him on a channel, uh, channel and, and the predicted markets had me at like a 10% chance of winning. And he's like, did you know that in one out of 10 alternate realities, you would be the governor <laughs> of California? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, stop flattering me. <laughs> well, so looking at all this hate, yeah, yeah. you know, here, here, here's what I'll go back and, and, and say this. My perspective, I think is fairly obvious. Yeah. Uh, I see a lot of people, especially with California, mm. the fear over, uh, like you mentioned, they said Larry Elder's going to kill your kids and take away masks and all this <laughs> yes, stuff. Yes. I mean, that is a paranoid delusion in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I got COVID. It was really bad. Yeah. I can certainly understand wanting to take precautions and I got no problem with that. Yeah. If you're on a private business and you want to say we want masks, I, whatever, man, I sure. guess. And then I can choose not to go to your business. Exactly. The mandates, I think, were, were nuts. But I think in the Democrat states, I don't know how it got so bad with the fear and the parano paranoia. Yeah. And then the Republican states was an inversion of it. It's almost pure tribalism. Yeah. But I feel like when it comes to what's happening to Donald Trump, my take on Trump is he's kind of a nasty dude. Mm. You know, he's mm. crude and he's crass. Mm. A lot of people really don't like him. And I totally get it. I think there's a lot of people who are in MAGA country, yeah. Ma like people that were uh, previously never voted before. Sure. Trump woke them up because oh, yeah. he's like a bull, you know, sure. bull in a China shop. But then I'll, t I'll talk to people and, you know, my friends from the cities and they'll say, like, here's what I don't like about him. And I'll be like, I, I can totally get it. They, oh, yeah. they, they find the way he speaks mm. gross, like sure. the insults, the fat pig comments. That being said, he's not a, a, a insurrectionist who you tried to overthrow sure. the country. And like sure. the January 6th stuff is completely out of hand. So what I end up seeing with that, as well as the fear over COVID and the paranoia yeah. and the the tribal nature of, of the Democratic Party. It seems clear to me that while the Republican Party is mostly garbage, mm. there is a, 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 a well, I guess I don't I don't know how we describe it because the the media likes to call it the right or conservative, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. you've got disaffected liberals, post liberal, moderate, conservative. Mm. It's more of the, I don't know, I, I call it freedom faction. Yeah, okay. People who, people disagree with each other, yeah. but can sit down and have conversations. I think most Americans can. I think that what the thing about Trump is that. Uh, people either love him or hate him, but they know where he stands. And I do think people like and respect that. And I think that's why Vivek has some popularity now as well, yeah. because he's very clear about where he stands. He outlines clearly, look, I believe in God. I believe in this is exactly what we should do with the Department of Education or the FBI or otherwise. But Trump's very much like that. Here's how I feel about China. Here's how I feel about whatever. He's very blunt about that. Uh, I think people like that. I think there is this uncertainty with, well, if Biden isn't being very clear with his positioning and we don't know who's running the white house is sort of the impression now <laughs> then then people have like well at least i know what i'm getting with with maybe uh you know yeah. trump or vivek or whatever or maybe even a combined ticket both of them together when well, you just heard trump say that he's open to vivek potentially as maybe I'd, a vp i'd love to see that yeah you know vivek said he doesn't want to do it uh, well, he has to say that because right. then he wouldn't get donations anymore. Of course he has to say that. But, and, and, but I mean, come right. the primary, if he's going to lose the primary, he's not going to say no to VP. <laughs> it comes I down don't know, that. though. I don't know. I mean, some people are concerned that the VP is actually a mostly do nothing position. Sure. But it sets you up for, I mean, look, Biden. Yeah. Right. Biden with Obama. 
And then you become president. Yeah, but Biden became president because of Trump, not because of Biden. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> Vote for anybody but Trump back then. That's true. You're right, probably right. right about and, that. Yeah. And then I think it was, you know, they, a lot of uh, ground activist efforts yeah. with ballot harvesting, with universal mail-in voting. Yeah. And, and other things, of course, procedural mm. changes. People are just going and saying, vote for anyone other than Trump. And so yeah. people are just filling out the ballot and sending it in. Yeah. I don't think Biden has that this time around. Oh, interesting. Less of that movement for Biden. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there was a movement for Biden. And and I think Trump supporters are completely correct when they say the enthusiasm for Biden was 26% in aggregate or whatever. Mm. How could he have gotten all of these votes? Sure. And then my response is always, did you look at the enthusiasm against Trump? Yeah, yeah. It was like 96%. <laughs> so when, when they would do these polls and talk to voters yeah. and say, do you want to vote for Biden? They'd say, no. Do you want to vote against Trump? They would say, yes. Yeah, and the, the enthusiasm against Trump was actually like a few points higher than <sighs> for him. See, I think that's what happened in California as well with Newsom. Do you want to vote for Newsom? No. Would you rather have Larry Elder? No. <laughs> you know? I wonder, do you, think, do you think if Larry Elder wasn't running, you would have, or, or they would have at least recalled Newsom? I think that would have been a high likelihood because wow. we, were, uh, we, we were polling better than the other candidates combined, when I did a, a debate against the Republicans uh, in, in SAC, uh, I was against the three other leading Republicans, not including Larry Elder. Uh, I was polling higher than all of them combined. So if there was no Larry Elder, then I think Californians would have seen, OK, if we recall Newsom, we can try Kevin for a year and it's it's still the D ticket. We can still get things done, uh, but uh, but it's a new vision. It's a new yeah. generation. And if it doesn't work, my my pitch was try me out for a year trade me in if you don't like me because it was only a one-year position <laughs> I, I remember this i think what people were saying was man we'd sure love to get rid of newsom this kevin guy sounds great but you can't risk larry elder bingo and so that's Crazy. why newsom didn't get recalled yep i mean there, there's something wrong with california man <laughs> oh 100 <100%. laughs> percent. yes <laughs> no no there's a lot wrong with california and don't get me wrong i look i've uh, my my wife uh, uh, led me to move to California. I've I've wanted to leave California for probably about the first ten years I lived there. Only more recently have I uh, come to accept that where we live in Southern California, we love the weather, and we are about to have a lot of children. We have twins on the way, plus well, maybe more. Thank you. There's there's a lot going on. So we 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 love that SoCal coastline. But if we had what was happening in San Francisco or L.A. happening in our town, which we call Kentucky, it still has a little bit of a conservative tilt to it oh, yeah. um if, if we had happening in san francisco in inventory we would leave in a heartbeat we'd have to we couldn't you couldn't live like that what's so i mean have, how long have you lived in california now since 2009 so yeah. what what's going on yeah well i think what what you have is uh there's there's so much of this established political belief that we we need to have incremental change at every level there's so much bureaucracy and that's why when i was running for governor my, my thesis was look we we have people dying on the streets deploy the national guard and let's solve homelessness wow in 60 days because theoretically what you need is you need homeless shelters in every part of various parts of the states wherever the homeless are put the shelters where the homeless people are because they're there anyway and provide them the services they need the medical health, uh, the medical services, the mental health services, the potential rehabilitation, or just a place to have a roof over their heads. Uh, so. Well, I mean, do you do you take them by force? Yeah, well, so that was always the big problem with with uh, the the um, this because you know you have a lot of the civil rights activism which says no, you you can't force people to go, and people don't want to go. They don't want help. They have mental health problems. But when you live on the street. Your deterioration is so rapid and fast. You can't you can't be helped anymore after a certain period of time. It's really yeah. sad, and it's devastating that you know. Then the fifth largest economy in the world is basically letting people die on the streets. So our rule of thumb was, you can do whatever you want. You just can't sleep on the streets. That's what we ran on. And so the idea was, if you sleep on the street, well, you need help. We'll move you over here. And if you want to get up, you know, take a shower and a bagel and a mental health business card <laughs> and leave, go for it. But you don't fall asleep on the street. I wonder, actually, I mean, this is, this is a big challenge yeah. the, between civil liberties yeah. and uh, the homelessness crisis. Right. Yes. So, you know, I lived in L.A. for a while, I actually worked for a homeless shelter. And yeah. so I got to experience it firsthand. And the big problem we saw was that no matter what you do, they wouldn't come. They would not come. Of course not. Yeah, of course not. Why would they want to? They wouldn't. Yeah. You know, freedom, <laughs> no authority over them. Yeah. Many of them are doing drugs. Yes. And it, and it is sad because in my experience, the majority of people who are homeless 
mm. chose to be mm. not. I'm, I'm not saying that they could decide today, like, I'm going to go get a house. No, I mean, they could seek help. Yes. Not that they yes. want to live out in the streets. <sighs> yeah. Everybody would prefer to have a home. But it was actually rare to ex to meet someone who would say, I lost my job and I'm desperate. Please help me. Yeah. It was usually get away from me. Yeah. We're going to go live under a bridge by choice. And and do you think that was because they had already been homeless for a while or because, you know, from day one, that's how they felt? Because I think once you've been homeless for like six months, you're you're so down that path. You know, I got to be honest. Uh, uh, I, I've been homeless a couple of times in my life. Yeah. Slept in a park maybe only twice. Oh, my gosh. It was yeah. when, I was, when I was younger, when I was probably when I was around like 19 or 20. And then uh, eventually got a car and lived out of that. Uh, yeah. But that it was it was moderately short lived. Yeah, there's no circumstance in which I would have wanted to go with a stranger into a building because it was disruptive to my plan, to my mission. Fair. You know, yeah. uh, I, I, I had a job. And, right. and so it's yeah. like often what I would do is you work, you work at the airline. You just yeah. sleep in the airport. Oh, interesting. Yes. Where did you shower? They have showers at the airport. Yeah, and uh, uh, there you go. Okay. But yeah, see, not so, everybody has that privilege, right? So, like, I try to put myself in the shoes of, you know, if you're homeless and you you want to go to work or even want to get a job, how can you if you don't have a bed to actually sleep to function or a shower to be clean? But this is this is this is my experience. Yeah. We, we we never encountered those people. We I, yeah. I, I I when you worked in the shelters. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and but yeah. even even throughout That's my tough, life, man. It Chicago's got a massive homelessness problem, yeah, which is true. weird because it gets so cold. Yeah, no kidding. But I lived off of Belmont in California, yeah. oh man, with fifteen some odd years longer, fifteen years ago, sixteen years ago. Yeah. And if you if you walk down uh, Belmont, there's a bridge, which is the highway, and it's homeless encampments, mattresses, yeah. sleeping bags. Yeah, you're not going to go to any one of these people and yeah. change their way of life. It's unlikely. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I, I think. I, I, I don't know how they get to that point. I know. Yeah. And we don't want that to be the case. But to go back to where we started on this, I wonder that. if you must, by force, yeah. say, if we just allow people to live on the streets, mm -hmm. it will never change. Correct. And there has to be a legal and moral limit to what we allow. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that was our thesis, was that if you are sleeping on the street, you're dying on the street and you're getting worse. So you can live, you can do whatever you want. You have all your freedom. You just can't fall asleep on the streets. But but that, that's where I wonder if, if yeah. and I'm not saying I, I can, I know definitively, but I'm wondering Nobody if- Nobody does. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The problem, I, that's the problem. That's why it's not solved. <laughs> there, there was a story about Northern California uh, take, uh, taking conservatorship of people who are homeless or something uh, like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what it was called, but they would- Basically, any income you had yeah. would go, would go, they would control your bank accounts. Yeah, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but I, yeah, I yeah. you know, and, but I, I have to wonder, man, the challenge is if we see someone who's anorexic, yeah, yeah, do we just say, well, you have your freedom not to eat and they die? Or do we recognize at a certain point, we as a society have to say, that's a good point. Yeah, but, but it's, <sighs> this is the challenge we face because we believe in freedom so much. Yes. We allow people to gorge themselves to death or not eat to mm -hmm. death. But we don't allow people to jump off a bridge. It's illegal to commit right. suicide, right? So what's what's the yeah, line? Is yeah, it yeah. it's somewhere? One's one so fast, it's shocking, and one so slow, we ignore it. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. I almost think that you're. That's a really good point. Is so that person's about to jump off the bridge? We must arrest them and 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 save them from themselves. 50. Yeah, exactly. But mental, and then and then well, they see a psychiatric, you know, person, or whatever, uh, and and get help. Now you're homeless, and uh, whatever, and everybody just turns a blind eye to it because it's the slow decay of society is really what it is. And yep. it's just getting worse now with the inflation and and and. Oh, uh, San Francisco's uh, getting scary. Huh? Oh well, and then you get the fentanyl, and oh, it's terrible. The uh, all these videos popping up of open air drug markets. It's terrible. In like California and Philly. And that's the thing too. It's like, if you allow people to do drugs yeah. and defecate in the street, it's going, it, it is a, it is a, it is a, I don't know what you, a, a festering mold. Oh yeah. That Nobody will, wants to live there. It will yeah. absorb other people too. Of course. If somebody, I'll tell you a story. I, I, uh, I met an old guy. This is back when I was like 19. Dude probably passed. It's been a long time. He was probably in his sixties. Uh, homeless black dude in Chicago. I had just eaten at like a pizza restaurant or whatever. I'm skating and I see this guy and he's like smoking a cigarette or something. And then, you know, he's panhandling or something. I'm like, I was like, hey, you want, you want some pizza? And he was like, yeah. And I'm like, because it's like half a pizza, you know, me and sure. my friends reading. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he takes it. And then I decided to ask, I asked him, I was like, hey, man, can I ask you a question? And he's like, shoot. And I was like, how did you, how did you end up 
you're homeless, right? And he's like, yes, sir. I was like, how did you end up out here? Yeah. He said he worked for the post office his whole life. Mm. The uh, uh, Eventually, they started laying people off. Yep. He gets fired from his job. He has no other expertise. Of course. He's got a small savings. He starts going around trying to find a job, can't. Yep. Eventually, his money runs out and he can't pay his rent. He gets evicted yep. and that's it. Yep. And I was like, friends, family? And he's like, he's like, man, he's like, my friends are dead. <sighs> he's like, he's like, you know, you don't understand. You know, I'm an old man. I knew people from my work, and that's all I knew. And my, my, like my, my, my family's passed on. I don't got any immediate family, and so here he is. And that's a guy where I was just like, man, that dude yeah. is a guy who needs help. Exactly. That yeah. would would take it, would take a job, wants a job. Mm. But my fear is when you have these open air drug markets, yeah. where can he go to sleep at night where he feels like he won't be bothered? Exactly. It's going to be around other people who are. But now all of a sudden another person is funneled into this pit of drug and, and despair. And of course, and of course, eventually you fall victim to the same thing, whether it's drugs or it's alcohol or both. It's sad. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's devastating. I think what'll end up happening is in the longer term, we're going to see more of, whether it's AI or innovation, replace so many livelihoods of people you're going to have to have universal basic income it's it's going to happen and i think that the economy will actually be so productive that i know a lot of conservatives now here any more fiscal money printing is just inflationary in the longer term i think our productivity will be so strong that we'll actually be able to support it you know for a while i was uh i was a proponent of universal basic income for for a similar reason yeah. but i'm not i'm not so convinced right now i think the economy will morph again yeah. into some way yeah where you know you look at x yeah. twitter yeah yeah people are <laughs> making so money from posting <laughs> so i'm not i'm not convinced that the answer is going to be universal basic income because i actually think that's a component of the problem right now oh, interesting well tell me more about this so you, you, a component of homelessness crisis is liberal handouts so to speak yeah the one of the reasons that in my experience working with these homeless shelters, yeah. one of the reasons that these people remain homeless. Uh, a, another example is when I was uh, living in Seattle, yeah. there's a group oh, of yeah. kids they call the the Av Rats, oh, yeah. Avenue Rats sure. yeah. uh, outside of uh, University, uh, UW, University of Washington. Because of the food banks and the ease of access to EBT benefits, yep. that's how they lived and they would not stop. Sure. Uh, yeah, could, yeah. there were the, it was really interesting to meet these guys, uh, guys, these young kids, they would, they would, they would put out calls through the internet. They would ride the rails. They would hop on freight trains to ride to Seattle over the course of a couple days, <laughs> come to Seattle because they said every day of the week is another food bank. Wow. And so, oh, sure. you know where to go. You do the rounds and, and you're allowed to get a box of cereal, uh, uh, a gallon of milk, a can yeah. of tuna, a can of beans. And then they would get every every day of the week, they'd go for free food yeah. and then they would go back to live on the streets oh, wow. because they were enabled yeah. to do so. Yeah. Well, the enablement is, is a really interesting line because, you know, you these are two very contrasting stories that you gave. One is the uh, choice of essentially taking and doing nothing and, and being unproductive. Uh, and then there's the. Uh, the forced on productivity of the example of the person who gave pizza, right? So right. how do you differentiate between the two? How is government supposed to differentiate between the two? Because yeah. on one extreme now, the people who are either forced unproductive or by choice unproductive end up falling victim to drugs on the streets. It's yep. terrible. And and I don't know that we're going to solve the solution, honestly, in our lifetimes. It's it's uh, it's going to be a long time. And hopefully it doesn't lead to a greater decline in, in America. But I do think the wealth gap will widen. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, definitely going to widen a lot. You, you, you look at a McDonald's with kiosks and there's like one or two people who make the food. Yeah. They've eliminated <laughs> yeah. half their staff. It takes forever now too to get your food. <laughs> yeah. But, but yes. you, you, we're, 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 we are marching towards, this is why I don't immediately discount universal basic income, yeah. but I think there's probably too many pitfalls and, and maybe we can find yeah. a better solution. But yeah. the more we see automation, especially with low skill jobs. Oh, for sure. I mean- I'm really excited for automating away journalists. I'm half kidding. <laughs> yeah, but, well, you know, we're doing that with, with yeah, yeah. chat GPT. Yes. Yeah, sure. You're going to have one guy who owns a McDonald's yeah. who has the capital to, to start it for whatever reason. Maybe yeah. it's inherited. Maybe this guy worked for 10 years. But now his profit margins are going to be through the roof because 
have you seen these videos where the robot makes the burger? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they can automate the full thing. Oh, there's a there's a pizza vending machine in uh, Vegas. Oh my gosh, of course it's Vegas. Right, yeah, yeah. and it's in a parking garage uh -huh. and you can press, and, and a slice of deep dish comes out fresh and hot or you can get it cold. So they have a machine, they have, they have uh, assembly lines auto manufacture the pizzas. Oh, that's unbelievable. But you still have a delivery guy for them. Uh-huh. But uh you know, everybody's seen the the robot ice cream man. He grabs the cup and the, or the robot grabs sure. the cup and then pulls the lever down. <laughs> what happens when you combine the high rate of low skill immigration yep. that's happening on the southern border yes. with the total automation? Competition will be so severe. Mm -hmm. And the lack of schooling, right? The schools yeah. are a complete failure in America. Complete failure. Yeah. Absolutely. I wish they I wish that wasn't true. I have so you many combine all of that? <sighs> so so yeah, I so I don't see Here's my fear with universal basic income. Take into consideration all the automation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some 25-year-old guy mm -hmm. sitting in his apartment playing World of Warcraft. Hey, I played WoW, okay? Me too. <laughs> what were you? Uh, rogue. No, oh. I started as a rogue. I went to Druid. Yeah, Druid's good because it's mm -hmm. versatile, but exactly. I, used to, I played vanilla early Same. on. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Did you get to Nax? An Axe? An Axe. Na uh, Naxxramas? Oh, man. I think, I think I may have got... No, 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 no. I think I got invited to one next. I've never done, never did next. I was, I was more PVP. I had tier two PVP oh, gear. Oh, that's actually pretty impressive. Warsong Gulch and Arathi. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you do uh, Burning Crusade? Yes. Oh, okay. That, yeah. that was my peak. Was um, Illidan, Burning Crusade. Alteric Valley was my favorite. Oh, you I liked AV. Were you Alliance then? Uh, yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah, that's, of course, that's why that was your favorite. Because you always I know, the whole got assholes. crushed every time. <laughs> what were we just talking about? <laughs> Universal. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> I think you'll you'll uh, find listless young people yeah, who yes, are yes. disassociating. Sure. Yeah. They might have apartments. Yeah. Uh, but my fear is effectively people living in pods. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, think Ready Player pods. One. You yeah. know, Ready Player One pods. Well, and, and I think that's almost where you have to, you, you have to almost combine, like, I think it's a disgrace that we graduate high school today and we don't know any skill really. There's There's no practical skill that we can do outside of high school for the vast, for 90 plus percent of people. Uh, I mean, 90, 99, I would say 100% of people need to know a financial education. Oh yeah. Yet we graduate people with maybe f like 5% of people with a financial education in school, but everybody takes a biology class. What for? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's it's inverse. It's the opposite. I know of about the, the, the phases of frog metamorphosis, but I don't know how to uh, <laughs> run, uh, open a bank account. Yeah. I was, uh, well, taxes. what's How's, you know, mitosis or meiosis going to help me make money? You know, <laughs> come on, man. It's crazy, isn't it? It is. It is. So, so I think you need a car. Like, I mean, really, there's a lot to fix and, and that's why it's going to take forever to do it. And that's why I think wealth inequality is going to explode. But um, so the rich are going to get a lot richer and the poor are going to get a lot poorer, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, I think games essentially yeah yeah that's a good point and it's almost like the the you've got uh it's uh what is it uh, it's like a battle royale that the fire's coming in from the outside yeah. more homelessness coming it's terrible um but i think the only way out of that is building more houses fixing schooling uh and then then helping people who have fallen beyond the level of being able to be helped you know i think what i think we needed purpose yeah, that and, and would be useful too vivek's running on that right uh, i don't national know. vision can He's, you i Ab teach he's purpose. amazing can like can you convince somebody who doesn't feel like they have purpose to have purpose yes really i do believe so okay. and this is man you know a lot of people rag on vivek but yeah whatever you think about the dude he's thought this through the he, national, he definitely has the and national, his support of trump by the way brilliant yeah well he's playing he's he's he's, he's playing it so perfect perfectly <laughs> yeah. but national identity and national vision is a core problem my my, my fear is People don't recognize how right he is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. We, you know, I talk about, we talk about the laws being broken. We, and I'm like, culture is everything. Yeah. You know, one of the big things we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks is in Florida, it's illegal for women to skydive on Sunday. What? Yep. Yep. <laughs> but where do you find this stuff? <laughs> they're, they're called like blue laws or whatever. But oh, okay. you Google search it, you find this law. And it's a really good example of there's a lot of illegal things that no cop will arrest you for. Sure. Yeah. And that's yeah. weird though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a good point. That means we all recognize we're all breaking the law all the time yeah, and good. the cops will, and the government will never do anything about it. That's true. Yeah. So the real issue is cultural. Uh, we need national identity and national purpose. I do think you can bestow it among people. Interesting. The challenge right now, I guess, is there is no central commanding narrative or authority in this country. So that's- There's no leadership, really. Yes. That, that, that vision- that's pushing the whole nation forward, that unifying vision. That's a good point. It, it is unfortunate that the best we got in a long time was Trump. 
He, the Artemis Project, going to the moon, creating a moon base to slingshot to Mars, is the kind of thing. And then you have Elon Musk with uh, yeah. a starship. Did you like Obama? Oh, uh, man. No, okay, well, we don't have to go there. <laughs> well, look, I voted for Obama the first time, really hoping that he was the outsider who was going to change things. Right. But here's the, here's the problem for me with Obama. I come from the anti-Bush generation uh, when with the with Iraq and Afghanistan. Of course. Oh, lies man. getting us into these foreign conflicts. Oil, man. <laughs> and then what does Obama do? He 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 exacerbates, proliferates. Drone he, strikes like crazy. That's drone strikes, point. the killing of American citizens. And I'm just like. Yeah, collateral damage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't think that Obama gave us a national vision or identity at all. Interesting. That's a good point. Like what, what hope and change. But what was the right? But that vision? was the campaign message. You're right. But then what was that actually? That's interesting. Now, on mm -hmm. the surface, Trump gave us MAGA, right. which is nebulous. Mm -hmm. Make America great again. Okay. okay. This vision that people post these these uh, old ads from the 50s of like the, the dad coming home with a briefcase and the kid <laughs> running up and hugging him. Yes. Oh. And the left calls that racist. What? Yeah, they no, they it. don't. Well, it's because all the ads are white, white, waspy families. Oh, I'm so tired of this. Stuff. I know, I know. It's, okay. it's, and, and, and that really bothers me because I'm like, dude, we want all families of all backgrounds to experience yeah. the love of their children did, coming did you home hear from a hard in day. California, they were thinking about doing reparations of a, like up to a what was it, like one point seven million dollars for more than that or something. It was a ridiculous each descendant number. of slavery or something like that. But the the board that voted on it, I want to say, I put this on Twitter somewhere. It was like California is like less than sixteen percent black. But that board that voted for operations was like 86% black. Well, this is the issue. <laughs> What's going on? Th 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 this, is, this is like the issue for me with the Democratic Party is it feels very superficial. Yeah. The, the, the noble- Messaging of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the noble white savior being Virtual like, signaling. Virtue signaling. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the, a lot of these Democrats, that, uh, they describe each other as white saviors. Oh, wow. And, yeah, but of course, you go to any- body of people and say we're going to give you free money for whatever reason they're going to be like i'll just take it keep your mouth shut yeah, right and so <laughs> I, I think the racial lines create tensions there huh. but uh, to go back to what you know vivek's talking about with the vision the, yeah the vision so how is he going to do that i mean it, like abolishing yeah, so the fbi the department of education like <laughs> i and, and he's he's picking uh, like that's obviously these are extreme things to say but but that's his point he's actually embracing extremism he wants people to call him extreme he says then because he says we need extreme change then you look at how similar he is instead of drain the swamp his thing is turn the log over and bring the pesticide. <laughs> you know, he's modeling right after Trump, which yeah. makes no Trump supporter be able to really hate Vivek. Well, also, <laughs> he's, really, the he's the perfect VP. Yeah, exactly. He's really he's, <laughs> he's defended Trump in all of the right ways. Yep, yep, yep. And when when he announced when 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 Ron DeSantis was in the talks, it was like a year ago, and yeah. he was he was in the prediction markets two to one. Oh, for to sure. Trump. I don't know what happened. Every, screwed up, man. <laughs> oh, I know. Everything we said is what Vivek is now doing. Yes. <laughs> I was saying, you know, DeSantis' strength is that he's younger. Yep. He's got a lot of the Trump policies, but he's more tactful. Yep. And the, the course, of course, they'll smear him. But Ron DeSantis' path to winning the primary and the general is to say, I love Trump. I'm only here because of Trump. He is. He is but I do think we're going to do things a little bit differently yep. while, you know, taking the road that he started, paving the path forward. I think we can reach voters that Trump might miss, yep. but we love the man. Instead, it became flame wars and-, and The Disney stuff. Yeah. What do you, what's your take on all that? And you know, I mean, this this crusade against Disney. It, it, it Boring and uninteresting for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. I do think, like what we're talking about national vision and identity and purpose. This is the core of everything. And opposing these corporations <clears throat> that have bad values right. is, is paramount. Sure. Laws only get enforced if the culture determines the law should be enforced. Yeah, that's a good point. So when Disney has- you know, uh, middle-aged fat men dressed as fairies. Oh, right, okay. You know, okay, yeah, like, we'll yeah. slow down there a minute, right? Yeah. Part of me, half of me is kind of like, I don't necessarily care right. if a company privately wants to do this, but a company as big as Disney who's putting these values in their shows, it's an mm. important thing to push back on. However, it seems weird that Ron DeSantis took a political approach to a cultural issue in this way that I don't think, the, I don't mm. think the jigsaw, don't think the puzzle piece fits. That's interesting because that was sort of, I mean, you said that so eloquently to what my suspicion was, should we be weaponizing all of the political efforts of Florida to basically get Disney? And it almost felt like it almost, that was almost the point where he started derailing his campaign. Yeah, Whereas maybe. I like what you're saying a lot better, which is redefining it or proper, I should say properly defining it as a cultural issue. Right. Interesting. Bud Light, Target. Yes. Richmond, North of Richmond, yeah. uh, Sound of Freedom. 
These are cultural issues that will help create national purpose and oh, yeah. reshape this country, but you can't be done at a political level. Right. It has to be the willpower mm. of the grassroots and the now, individual. Now, what's your take? So I read the target earnings call last week. I mean, I read company or I'm a finance guy. So right, right. I read this boring. I mean, look, I'm dressed like finance bro, right? <laughs> so I'm like, well, yeah, it is what it is. I know. It's my real estate <laughs> company. Know, whatever. So, um, but uh, in the, their earnings call, they spent a good page in the transcript complaining about how... Uh, you know, we were seen as a safe space for LGBTQ, and and now we have uh, people coming into our stores harassing our staff to where we have to basically take those things down. So this is where, like, where's where's the balance? Is it should a company be providing that safe space? I I personally, I'm just as a father gonna say, I get annoyed when I'm trying to find where the boys' clothing is because I'm trying to find a bathing suit for my son. And it's, it's, here's a dress, here's the boy clothes, here's a dress. It's because they don't have a boy and girl clothes section anymore. It's all oh, yeah. children's now. It's like, come on. Right. This, it's, 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 these companies are beholden to social media, which they think is culture and it's not. Intre oh, that's a good line. Right. So we are moving towards this, but I think there's a, a massive resistance to it. Culture is everything. Like, like we've, I've already said 50 million times, law doesn't matter if the culture won't enforce the law. Good time, absolutely. And, and, and certain, like, this could be really, really bad stuff. Like yeah. we saw rioters in 2020 yeah. not getting arrested, getting lawsuits because the culture is, is allowing it. Uh -huh. So Target sees this corporate zeitgeist of we're all safe spaces now. But this is realistically a single digit portion of the entire economy. Yes. So what happens? For the longest time, you've got the liberal sensibilities of we support our LGBT allies, absolutely, which is a yeah. total of between like two and seven percent of the population, sure. depending on what your metric is. Yeah. Republicans eventually fall into the camp of, you know what, we, we really just don't care about what people are doing. Exactly. In privacy. Don't put it on my children. Don't put it on my children. But what ends up happening is that social movement, you know, back in 2008 to 2012 with gay marriage and all that stuff created this corporate perception of. Hey, this is really popular among our urban oh, audience. Wow. We should embrace it with no checks and no balances. So it goes to the extreme. Goes to the extreme and yeah. you end up with the target phenomenon. The media lies and the media's lies don't matter to reality. And the reality Tell was the media is saying that right wing individuals are harassing target employees. Mm -hmm. However, the conflict in targets started before the you know, anti-establishment, anti-woke movement ever caught wind of what, what Target was doing. Right. So when the story first broke that Target had to move their LGBT items to the back of the store, yes, yes. you already had instances where parents had complained to staff about it. Uh, then the culture war right, or whatever you want to call it, picks up the story and then engages with it. Interesting. The media narrative yeah. becomes that right-wing influencers were pushing this when in reality- It was parents. It was, it was right, it, or, or you know, whoever. Right, right, right. But it started before there was a cultural conflict over The 95% the of American culture was saying, hey, you know, this is either confusing or we don't like this or whatever. Uh, but then it's been labeled I as mean, look a at, wing. Look at Bud Light. Yeah. 30% or whatever drop in their market, like or $30 billion, mm, yeah. 20 to 30% drop in sales. Oops. That's, that's going corporate uh, corporate to the extreme. And you saying media lies, by the way, brings me back to my campaign. CNN ran uh, a headline saying, um, no Democrats challenge Newsom. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell? You know, yeah, I'm, I'm like the top polling on. Democrat in the recall elections. So yeah. We had to send him a cease and desist letter. They're wow. so willing to just lie. Oh, it's, it's, they're, 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 it's, I think it's obvious to anybody who's paid attention for a long time. They're just in the bag for the Democratic Party. Oh, that's crazy. Or that's the, crazy. the establishment, whatever you would call it. You know, the more extreme view is Mockingbird. Oh, yeah. With Operation yeah. Mo yeah, that <laughs> they're actually intelligence infiltrated, oh, wow. trying to prop up their establishment wing. Sure. But look at Gavin. The George Soros kind of thing. <laughs> I, oh, I don't think George Soros is necessarily in that okay, ballpark. Okay. okay. Soros, I view as in like an extraneous, massively influential yes. political he's activist. I mean, he's donates billions of dollars. To yeah. yeah. But, you know, the CIA infiltration of media agencies, which is a fact, I don't know about today. Sure. That's the argument. Yeah. But I, I don't see why they'd stop. But that's, you know, it's, it's, it's different, but similar. Uh -huh. But you look at where Gavin Newsom is now, uh, right now, and the theory is he's going to run 2024 and somehow Biden takes an exit. Yes. So you were in the way. 
<laughs> he, Newsom needs his arc. Wow, you're right. Because if he lost, he wouldn't become president. Yep. Where would he be wow. right now? Okay, on his vineyard somewhere. <laughs> and the funny thing is, if you if you won that recall, I genuinely believe California would be doing such a lot better. No, well, thank you, and then you might actually find yourself, people asking the questions, is, is me, Kevin, going to be the, the candidate for president? I mean, uh, yeah, sure. who does the Democratic Party have? Yeah, it's interesting. Even You're Newsom right. is not that great. Right. But he's right. the best that anyone can, can it's true. hypothesize this, yeah. as that, you know, who Maybe Trudeau can come down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my but, uh, but I think, you know, in, in, in your situation, what we saw during the recall was there's a lot of people who say, I'll never vote Democrat. I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm sick of the Democratic Party mm -hmm. and empowering anybody who's a Democrat just gives the Democratic Party power. Mm -hmm. But then you pop up and you're saying the things that Democrats are supposed to be saying sure. yeah. in a in a similar but relatively different way to what we're seeing now with RFK Jr. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. RFK Jr. has got his more um, medical approach and yes. anti-establishment yes. and lockdown approach. Yeah. You are like you're you are from a kind of a different time period. Sure. But but I think there's a, a similar view in, hey, this guy actually might save the Democratic Party and no. and, and reintroduce a moderate approach and push this bad stuff out. What we need is moderatism in politics. Uh, this is getting a little extreme. But then but then that also then we, we question, do we need that extremeness? Because that's basically Vivek's platform. It's let's go. Right. Yeah. So it's like, ah, uh, like, so we, we want Democrats to be moderate. But then, no, we need the extreme. So do you need an extreme to fight the extreme? And does it just that hate chart keep going? But look at look, look, RFK, I think, is more similar to Vivek in a lot of ways. Well, I believe that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But well, that's why people are calling him a Republican in sheep's clothing. I mean, it's the same thing they told me. <laughs> and that's the winning path forward. Oh, interesting. I, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe it's not true. Um, if, if RFK goes for the approach of let's try and get as many Republicans as possible to support us, yeah. that will pull from Trump's base or will pull the never Trumpers. And the Democrats who don't think Biden can run, he's too old and he's not appropriate, might actually go for RFK Jr. The media has to lie about RFK then. However, part of me then looks at this Wall Street Journal tribalism thing and I'm like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe the Democrat who wins is going to be the I will destroy Donald Trump and everything around him if you vote for me. Right. Yeah. Jim? Which I wonder, I wonder what I wonder if Newsom was running, how that would look, because. Trump doesn't really attack Newsom. Trump. He called him a nice guy. I know. And that they <laughs> get along or have gotten along. That's, would, I, that's smart on Trump's part. It kind of is. Yeah. Could, could there be a like because then you almost somewhat could potentially win over some of the Dems. Yep. Who really don't want to see California apply to the rest of the country. Donald Trump is going to win Donald Trump's base and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Yeah. yeah well, that's for sure. And his, <laughs> his support is unwavering. Yes. It is. Uh, uh, but then you've got people that are in a position like me where. I was always like I well, I was pretty far left when I was a lot younger sure. and then I've always been urban Democrat like college time. -ish. I mean, when I was a teenager, it was yeah. like anarcho punk rock, okay, yeah, skateboard, okay, okay, yeah, okay. you know, like lefty anarchy. Okay. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I know how to play baby. I'm an anarchist on the guitar and still do. And uh, but, you know, it's really interesting. Buffalo uh, Springfield, you know, I kind of do, do you know the song baby. I'm an anarchist. Oh, yeah. It that song helped push me away from the far left. Because I got really pissed off at that line when it came time to throw bricks to the Starbucks window. You left me all alone and you're a spineless liberal. And I was like, <laughs> hold on, dude. I was like, if we're trying to solve these problems and bring about this, you know, cooperative utopia, I don't understand why you're telling me to go smash windows. Right. And that that message in the song, I never liked. And that pushed mm. me away. But um, I kind of forgot where I was going with. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Trump's he's not going to lose his base. But if Trump says. You know, Newsom's a nice guy. I, I, I've uh, I worked with him, and we got along really, really, really well. Got, man, Dang. And uh, <laughs> if he if he takes that approach, yeah. Trump's base is, is just going to immediately be like, "How honorable of Donald Trump! We love him for doing this." Then you're going to get more middle of the road people, uh -huh. and and political memory is very short. Oh, for sure. You're going to get middle of the road people being like, oh, "Trump's that's reasonable." To, yeah, he's he's being more reasonable. He's trying to work with the the the, the urban liberals who hate Trump will always hate him. Yeah, yeah his yeah. base will always like him. But the people who are now being initiated into politics because of an economic crisis or yes. because of war or whatever are going to hear a more moderate Trump mm -hmm. praising a Democrat. Yep. I think it's a smart move on Trump's and part. And they decide elections. I, I, I think yeah. we, everybody frequently forgets it's not all of the ones who are the base on the right or the base on the left. It's that middle group. Where are they voting? That seems to decide. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm never voting for a Joe Biden. I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Yeah. I laughed in 2016 at the idea of Trump and Hillary because I'm like, you got 
crazy warmonger and you got goofy reality TV guy, count me out. But then when it comes down to it, it's like- So dude, you just don't vote then? Yeah, I didn't vote. Oh, okay. I back, And then in 2020, I voted for Trump. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, no wars, you know? But yeah, I, I wonder if Trump's approach works. I think the important thing to consider is that Trump only lost by about 42,000 votes in 2020. Between three in states. those particular battleground states, right, right, right. Combined. Right. Yes, but yes, if he sure. won those states, he would have won. Exactly. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's close. I mean, so, it's so what do you yeah, think about win. like the economy going forward? And yeah, like, let's yeah. let's talk about the economy, man. I don't know. I'm not an economic guy. <laughs> uh, but we've had Shark Tank guy say there's going to be a rebalancing, he called it. Oh, okay. But he's a, he's been a little back and forth. I'm seeing new articles pop up now where he's like, no, no, it's going to be fine. And Michael Burry's wrong. Then you get Michael Burry, for those that aren't familiar, of the of Cyan, uh, what is it, Cyan Management or yeah, whatever? Yeah, Wealth Management. Yeah. Wealth, wealth Management. Yeah. He's betting against the, the market. Yeah. I heard this yesterday. I don't know if it's true. Someone super chatted us that Citigroup and Bank of America have a massive multi-billion dollar short position against the U.S. economy. I mean, here's here's the thing. Uh, all of the banks have to hedge, right? So it's easy to look at their balance sheets and say, of course, they have a you know notational uh, uh, multi-billion dollar short because they're hedging their long positions. But what's remarkable is even though you have a lot of this bearish discussion, uh, I was just reading some uh, statistics uh, uh, put out by... Um, Oh gosh, Vanda Track, I believe, put this out. They they are a research firm and they look at all this data and they say hedge funds and the banks they're they're talking about how concerned they are and how they want to you know hedge the market. But then when you look at their actual positioning, they're heavily exposed to just the big mega caps and the S and P yeah. five hundred and you know <laughs> the Nasdaq because the long term trajectory is probably up. So the big short was trending on Netflix. Yes, of course. And I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah, I mean, of course. You probably knew about it well before the movie even came out. Uh, <laughs> But there's a really interesting part of the movie where the uh, the protagonists are dumbfounded that their credit default swaps are not, you know, going into the positive territory for them, despite sure. the fact that defaults are on the rise. Sure. That yes. The mortgages are 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 collap the securities are collapsing and they go to the banks and they're like, What's our pitches? And they're like, unchanged. And like, how is that possible? Right, right. Because yes. the banks were offloading their exposure sure, to sure. unsuspecting smaller banks and individuals. Of course. And then as soon as they were clear, they went, oh yeah, it's over. Everything's yes. collapsing. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, the same thing happens today, every single day with IPOs. I mean, you could look at VinFast or or even probably what's going to be the ARM IPO. Almost all these IPOs are just insiders offloading and just <laughs> ripping off the, the normal investor. And it's sad. It's really hard to build wealth. I, I saw that. Yeah. I, I saw the stat uh, that defaults are rapidly on the rise yes yeah, yeah. what are we are we looking at something akin to 2008 no uh so what what we're looking at is a lot of a normalization because you had basically it was impossible to default during covid right uh even now you know there's this fear about us hitting a wall with the student loan crisis but uh whether it's right or not the biden administration has made it that we can not make our payments for an extra year with no impact to our credit or otherwise. So about 50% of people, uh, based on the latest Bloomberg survey, are expecting not to even start making payments. Right. So they're, you're, they're calling it the on-ramping or whatever. Right. So it'll, it'll probably be a slow kind of like it's going to hit consumer spend over the next year, but right? If people, if, the, if pay, repayments start yes, yes. and yes. people won't start paying it back right away. Yes. Here's, so the first thing is interest rates kick in, yes. I think, today. Yes, you are paying, you are going to owe interest. That's, and yeah. but the first payment isn't due until next year. The next the next cycle. I mean, technically it's due, but it, they're not going to like ding your credit or file your, fees against your whatever. But your loans year. will get bigger. Yes, they will. Them. They will. Yes. They will. Doesn't that lend itself to as soon as this on ramping period is over, mm -hmm. the delinquencies are masked, and there will be a big shock to the system when all of a sudden the debt spikes massively for yes. these people. <laughs> there there will be a massive debt bubble like great reset at some point in the future. I don't know if it'll be in our lifetimes. I think. You know, fiat currency, every fiat currency that has ever existed has collapsed. The amount of debt that exists today. I mean, that's a scary thought too, right? Uh, it's like, where's my gold now? You know, yeah. <laughs> golden bullets, man. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, yeah, well, uh, then and then you look at um, the, uh, the massive amount of debt that we have. But what's remarkable is what you're seeing today is rich get richer. And that could actually keep us going for much longer. So here's something crazy. Interest rates have gone straight up, right? net interest payments in the country on corporate debt have fallen. And that's because, guess what the richest companies are doing today, the richest 10%, think the apples of the world. They're able to borrow money 
at 10, 20 years at 4%, then they deposit it into money markets and they earn 5%. Wow. So net, even though interest rates are going up, net interest payments are going down. How do I do that? <laughs> I know, right? Well, the way you do it is, is <laughs> you know, you, you bar, what you do is, I mean, it, I guess, see, the problem is as an individual, you really can't. I mean, you used to be able to with, with uh, a home mortgage, but now if you try right. to get a mortgage, it's like 8%. See, Apple can borrow for 20 years at basically 4%. We can't do that. Well, how, Rich how, corporations how they, can. How are they able to do that? Well, because they can borrow at essentially no premium over the 10-year bond market uh, because they're basically deemed just as risk-free like an apple right like less likely of defaulting almost less likely of defaulting as our dysfunctional congress you know in a 10-year treasury that's a mon- it's a free money machine it's free money it's absolutely it's free crazy money. yeah and so now what happens is but like the, the black rocks yeah. the state streets vanguard oh, yeah. they're doing they're doing all this well of course because yeah. think about it i mean uh, these pension funds and, and these institutional investment companies they need to earn their five six seven percent which you can now get basically risk-free in treasuries it's insane i mean you can now get six percent on a three-month cd with your bank it's insane yeah yeah um, the, uh so apple uh, uh was advertising their 4.15 yeah. percent yep. savings account yep yep and now they're all stepping over each other who's who can offer more right to get now, the now i think uh yeah. uh sofi's got a four and a half yep uh ufb's got a 5.25 jp morgan said if i wire them uh, at least two million dollars they will give me six months six uh, percent for a year They'll lock me in at six percent for a year because they want man. They want the capital. Yeah, I mean, is it really worth it? I mean, is is inflation worse than this? I mean, is it? <sighs> yeah. this, this is my question, right? Because you know, obviously, we are a company here. We in, we invest. Yeah. We have our reserves. We have our uh, assets. Yeah. And the question is, if we keep you know finances liquid cash yes. in a savings account at four yeah. percent are we just losing money uh it's it's probably prudent to have a, obviously a, some form of a balanced portfolio where you have your longer term investments real estate yeah. and stocks right and and expanding your business but it's also good to have cash because we don't know what could happen next year the the big bear fear is that the inverted yield curve today, the fancy bond market red flag, is that we're going to have mass joblessness next year. And that mass joblessness is going to lead the Federal Reserve to cut rates, which will lead to inflation again. Yeah, That is the bare thesis right now. And that's the great reset, the market's collapsing thesis. And, and do you think that's the case or no? I don't. Okay. So the reason I don't think that's the case uh, is mostly because if we look at the last 40 years, we've been on a path of lowering inflation and lowering interest rates. We printed way too much money, excessive amounts of money during COVID. So I think that when we're in 2030, we're going to look back and go, well, no, duh, we had massive inflation <laughs> after we printed all right. that money. Of course. If, if they're right about, if you're wrong about the economy, they're right about joblessness yes. and inflation. Yes. Trump wins. 100%. And, and so that's what's going to be very interesting is if we're not in a recession, who wins then? Yeah. It's 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 hard to know for sure, especially with the political games that are being played. But yes. there's a big incentive right now to at least do whatever they can to hold up the popsicle sticks so that, that everything doesn't, doesn't come crum, uh, crumbling down. Oh, well, of course. I mean, there's also that element of like what well, the data could be, you know, rigged, so to speak. I mean, the, nobody believes really the inflation numbers or CPI or jobs or these numbers. They always get revised down. And so there's, of course, the the jaded POV that, hey, like we, we could be in a way worse situation than we actually think. And to some extent, history says that's true. History says joblessness comes way after. <laughs> you know, like, so let's talk about this. I want to go back to the 6% thing because I think the average person probably wants to understand this because I do. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk practical. $2 million. (laughs) Yes. And you put it into a savings account or what? Yeah, so a CD. A CD, Yeah, exactly. So so what what is that? What is that? What is it? It's basically, exactly. It's basically a way of saying, here, bank, here's my money. I promise to leave it here for a period of one, three, six, 12 months. And you will get 6%. For doing nothing. So we're talking 120 grand. Uh Uh-huh, yes. And on 2 mil, yes, exactly. You don't need a job. You, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's this is the this is you know when I'm younger, I'm wondering how does this work that you can just make money by having money. I yes. mean, this, the, there's the famous uh, uh, I shouldn't say famous, but there's the quote from Thirty Rock where uh, Liz Lemon goes to uh, Donaghy and she's like, "I want to do the thing rich people do where they make money from money." Yes. What do I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, and I think that's where practical finance is so useful, and that's I'm a big fan of that on my channel, and it's. 
you have to control assets because I really believe no matter what happens in the economy over the next year or two, nobody knows. It's a crystal ball. You know, It's a crystal ball what's going to happen over the next two years. It's either we're going to go into recession, shallow recession, or no recession. It doesn't matter. The one thing that we know, and I think we've agreed on multiple times in this, is that wealth inequality is going to grow. Oh, yeah. So how do you prevent being stuck on the side that's not growing your wealth? And the answer is you have to own the means of production, which are, <laughs> I know, you have to be an owner, which sounds intimidating, but it's really buying your first house. It's turning that into a rental property when you buy your next house. Right. Buying and controlling more real estate. It's buying stocks. It's starting businesses. Or if you're not starting businesses, because not everybody's an entrepreneur, it's taking your salary and using that salary to buy real estate. The richest firefighters and police officers, because I was a police explorer for three years and volunteered with firefighters as well. The richest ones were people who said, I make the salary plus my overtime. My salary is maybe 60. With overtime, I'm at 90 or 100. I'm going to have a pension after 20 or 30 years, depending on the department. The richest ones were the ones who, who said, I'm going to keep my debt low. I'm going to use my salary, my W-2 income, and buy real estate. Yeah. Hands down. I've, I've heard a lot of stories about that, actually. Firefighters who are landlords. I think being a landlord sucks. It does. It's hard. Yeah, I don't want to go anywhere. Ew. That's why there's money to be made there. Right. Because and somebody has to supply rentals. Imagine there were no, everybody hates landlords. Okay. Everybody hates landlords because 99% of them suck. There's, there's greed, there's slumlordness, there's low quality renovation work. It's dis, it's a disgusting business. And most people hate landlords. But if there were no landlords, there would be no rental property. We need landlords. You need we, landlords. We, we love our landlords. <laughs> well, because <laughs> how could you rent otherwise? Right. This is the funny thing that, you know, the left very much mocks the idea of landlords. They say abolish landlords. And yes. I'm just like, you know, when they we, going back to like homelessness. Oh, yeah. The one thing that annoyed me more than anything was when they said, you, I get these friends of mine or activists being like, did you know that there are more empty houses than homeless? And I'm <sighs> like, tell me what that means. Yeah, yeah. You think that means you can take a homeless person and put them in a house? Right. Do you know what happens if you do that? Yeah. The house just falls apart. The homeless person oh. doesn't. Their circumstances don't change. No. You're basically hiding the homeless person and their problems. Right, right. Some, and, some houses have to be built, maintained. Yeah. Like property taxes are used for a variety of things. And we can absolutely say it's BS to force people to pay tax or whatever. But there's sewer systems, there's roads, there's a, a public infrastructure and electricity. And then you have maintaining the house itself. Yeah. People who, who don't own property... Imagine what happens, and you know this exactly, oh, yeah. you buy a house and then you forget about it. Yeah. What happens in six months? Oh my gosh, everything breaks. And <laughs> Every, you, 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 if you just leave it there, yeah. you'll come back to mold, bugs, water damage. In fact, you might even come back to find the house is raised because a fire started and nobody yeah. knew it happened. True. So you, you need somebody who's in it. Mm. It has to be used, has to be utilized. Yeah. And the, 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 the landlord, I know it's such a dirty term for, for the political left. It's, yeah, they're slumlords. They're bad landlords. Oh my gosh, yeah. And bad. then there are people who are retirees mm -hmm. who saved up money to pay for the cr creation of a home yeah. that you, starting out your life, can't afford to build. Exactly. And then you pay rent. And then the argument comes, they're like, why are why is the rent more than the mortgage? Like, why am I, why are they making money? Off me? Well, they're doing work. Sure. The landlord is- And that's not true today with interest rates where they are now. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. But, but, but yes, generally what you're saying is correct. Yes. The, yes. the, the general concept- They're providing value. The right, the pure idea of a landlord, which perhaps has been corrupted, yeah, oh yeah, is yeah. let's go back in time. Me and my friends get together and take our ex extra wood and materials and time, and we build a house. Yeah. Someone who did not have the resources to do it says, yeah. "I need a place to live," and we say, "We'll let you live here. Yeah. Just you're you're going to pay us for everything we did to build this." Exactly. And then you end up making a couple hundred bucks, if that, a, a month. Right. You know, I, I don't know how much it. it, it what I can tell you is that when I was renting, yeah. I had a house, we moved out of it. And I said, what do we do with it? And I was like, let's just rent it out. Sure. And the responsibility is too great. It's a pain in the butt. Yeah. If, especially if you're not doing it at scale, it's a pain in the butt. Absolutely. Yeah. For me, it's like I run this business. Yeah. I absolutely cannot be managing or you know, trying to maintain or even have another text. <laughs> hey, furnace is out again. <laughs> furnace is out. Air conditioning is breaking. And I'm like, I, I, you know, storm comes, tree falls over. And I said, would you like to buy this house? <laughs> I don't, I, it's, it's a lot of work and it's yeah, not easy. Yeah, yeah. And it's a full-time yeah. job if you're managing properties. Mm. What, what a lot of people don't realize when they're renting is owning, owning a house comes with a lot of hard work and responsibility sure. to maintain that property. Right. So you can, you can hire someone to do it for you. Oh, yeah. You, know? you got to pay for that then.
Exactly. Then you're paying for it. So then I guess it comes down to this this practical problem, though, because now what's really popular on social media is this talk about, oh, we're worse off today than we were in the Great Depression, which is mostly based off cherry pick data anyway. Let me let me pull up that tweet. Uh, oh, oh. Let me see. <laughs> we, yeah. uh, we have it somewhere. Here yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, Isabel Brown. Uh, mm -hmm. We like Isabel. She's cool. She's cool. She uh, made this. She has this clip where uh, which she actually, copied off another TikTok. I'm sorry to say it, <laughs> but she there was another one that went viral before hers that I reacted to, and then I saw hers go viral, and I'm like, she used the same data. Stop it. No. <laughs> let's uh, anyway. let's let's play this. Is the audio gonna? I heard a new term on TikTok to today to? that made me stop in my tracks. Can, we are yeah. living in the silent depression. This guy believes we are not just living in worse than the Great Depression. We're living in the silent depression. The average annual income in 1930 for an American individual was a little over $4,800. Sounds like nothing. But if you adjust that for inflation, a little over $4,800 a year in 1930 is equivalent to almost $85,000 annually for the average salary for one person. Right now, the average annual salary is $56,000 a year. We currently are making less than the height of the Great Depression. In 1930, gas was on average 10 cents a gallon. That would be about $1.73. In case you All right, so we'll stop there because what you just said was wrong. Yes. And there's a community notes fact check on it. Oh, there is now. Thank you. God. Yeah. And, it, <laughs> and, and community and notes for the win. Let's go. And it proved you right. Yes. So no way. <laughs> your tweet is inflation adjusting to 24,000 or half of today's income. And the community note actually links to uh, the, uh, I think it's uh, Foundation for Economic Education. Is that what it's called? FEE. And it says the same exact thing. Uh, the 4.2K salary from the video adjusted for inflation at 95K today is pulled from IRS taxable returns, which only accounted for 1.3% of the population. The real inflation adjusted salary from 19, uh, 1933 would be 24,500. Here's the interesting thing about all this too, though. People don't take into consideration the advantages and necessities of tech uh, that come with technology, mm -hmm. how it changed our world mm -hmm. and created different economic requirements. Yeah. So, uh, yo, uh, my dad didn't have a cell phone or a TV. Right. Those expenses did not exist. Right. So expenses or tools? I guess is the way you look at that, huh? <laughs> they're they're both really they're both. That's true. But okay. Yeah, fair. Cell phones an obligation. Yeah, it's true. If yeah. if uh, you gotta get mid mobile, man, it's like fifteen bucks a month. It's getting cheaper and it's getting more accessible. <laughs> and you know that's just T-Mobile rebranded. Oh, is it really? Well, T-Mobile did buy them. But before T-Mobile bought them, uh, sorry for the tangent. Before T-Mobile bought them, Mint Mobile was just a way to sell T-Mobile bands to people who wouldn't pay the 90 bucks a month for right. T-Mobile. It's so Cricket, it's, Metro, it's right, all the same it's thing. It's charging people based on what they're willing to pay, which is the best thing a corporation could do from a corporate point of view is charge people who are willing to pay $90, $90. Yep. And the people who can only afford 15, 15. <laughs> now, to be fair though, we went with T-Mobile because mm -hmm. when you go for these uh, um, contract networks or whatever, yes. that's like, it's part of the T-Mobile network. They, they'll give you a data cap. They, they, they okay, prioritize yes, their core base. Yes. Okay. So if you need a lot of data, this is true. Right. And then the prioritizing... I think they're building enough antennas, but yes, you are yeah. correct. That's how what they say. Yes, yes. Sorry so, for the tangent. But, <laughs> but so, <yes>. so <laughs> right now, you know the real hack, by the way, is to do all of them. All of them. So no, well, I, I'm a YouTuber. So on each <laughs> phone, I have two SIMs. They're eSIMs. Mm, yeah. So when you look at the top, which I'm on airplane mode now, I actually have like AT and T, Verizon, T Mobile, yeah. and that way I always have data. Right. Uh, but I need it for my job. <laughs> I, I just can't stand AT&T. No, it sucks. But when yeah. T-Mobile and Verizon are down, I love it. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, you know, back in the day, I had every one of them. Because yeah, 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 you we needed were it. Building mobile tech. Well, you were mobile then. I mean, you wore your body cam before there were body cams. Right. We had hotspots. <laughs> yeah. I had a hotspot for every network. Yeah. Remember WiMAX? Oh, my gosh. No, I don't. <laughs> but that I was the, it, was, it was one of the first 4G networks. Oh, wow. It okay. hit around one to two megabits uh, <laughs> oh, up and down. Oh, yeah. But it was like, you know, Sprint was trying to get out with 4G faster than anybody. Yeah. YMAX is basically gone. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, anyway, I don't even, sorry for the tangent. <laughs> you know, but people are probably like, oh, what is that even? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Here, here's my thing about yeah, um, yeah. This, the, the uh, uh, social the current, media, the current salaries. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That I think people should, con should consider. And I, I don't know what it ultimately means, but yeah. my dad did not have to buy a cell phone yes. or a cell phone plan. That yes. expense didn't That's exist. You go, you, you, you try to apply for a job at Starbucks yeah. and they're going to say, what's your cell phone number? And you're going to say, I don't have a cell phone. They're going to say, are you kidding? Right. How do we get in touch with you? Right. Like, call me at home. I have a landline. Yeah. And they're going to be like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, that's nuts. I'll text you. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. Most, I think most companies are going to say, 
they don't have a, they don't have a cell phone. What's we can't hire them. Well, probably. Or are, are you going to get a cell phone? Can we get you a cell phone? Like, what's right. the deal? And so the salary may be better, but I do mm. think there's more expenses expenses oh, yeah. associated well, with and housing's living. way more unaffordable today. Right. Uh, and, and so you're right. There are a lot of more expenses that we have, plus housing more affordable. Now we can work remotely. And so maybe we have less of a commute. And, you know, the cost of a TV is a fraction of what it used to be and, and whatever. But you're right. You have more of these societal obligations. And, and it's probably the biggest one is housing, too. Healthcare. Oh, my gosh. That's another big problem. But what do you do? Do you turn into Canada where you have to wait uh, six months to get a freaking exam because they have universal health care? Do you turn into Germany where they have great health care? But again, you know, you're, now you're paying 55% in taxes all over, right. right? And then Canada attacked on the, if you don't want to wait, we can always kill you. Oh, no, no. You, you saw that, right? That. No, I didn't hear Medical that. assistance and dying. <gasps> The, tons of stories of this. There's a veteran who needed a chairlift and they said, we, it'll take, you know, X amount of time to build the chairlift or have you considered medical assistance and death? No way. Yeah. There's a story of a woman. She did a commercial where she's like, this is my choice. I'm choosing to go my way. And the story was that she went for medical health. Uh, uh, she went, she went to the, to the system for uh, treatment. Sure. Of, uh, genetic they triage you. Yeah, exactly. They said no. And they said, but we can't kill you. And she said, then I choose death because I can't live with this anymore. So there's a lot of questions about this. Oh my god! First, first of all, I think medical assistance and dying is at this at with the degree they're they're, they're going from they're going in Canada now. Uh, mental health issues warrants it, and they're even allowing in some. They, they want to make it so that kids can get it without oh parental consent. Oh my god! Right, it's getting crazy. But I'm getting chills thinking about that. Like, please, like, keep all this shit away from kids under 18. Oh yeah, but Sorry. they're 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 not. And so here here's the thing to consider though. Your dental care today yeah. as a poor person is better than Rockefeller's dental care. Oh, that's interesting. The, the technical, technical yeah. I mean, look, who, how many people had refrigerators and air conditioning oh, in the 40s? Ice back then, you know? <laughs> yeah. they, it, it's really amazing when you go to these uh, old houses out here in yeah. Appalachia, yeah. Civil War territory, and you can go tour <gasps> these homes, and they're like, here's the cooling cellar where they kept their meat. And I'm like, it's literally just the basement. <laughs> yes, they would hang meat in the basement. Salt it. <laughs> Good salt luck. Salt it and hang it. Yeah. And then try and eat it as fast as you can. In fact, one one place I uh, I checked out. Now we call that curing. <laughs> yeah, it's all branding. The, the, the meat storage was upstairs, and oh. I'm like, it's gonna get hot. Yeah, didn't matter. And then they would carry it down this little spiral staircase. Oh, wow. There was a cup. It's, it's so crazy. There's a cupboard in the kitchen that's like two feet wide, and when you open it, it's this extremely narrow spiraling staircase oh, wow. to go up to the meat room to grab the meats to bring them down to the kitchen without obstructing the flow that's of the house. So weird. So the chef wouldn't walk into the master dining area and right. bother anybody. But my point is, there is, we have tremendous uh, uh, technological advancement that benefit our lives in ways that never before, but we're also still miserable too. And how do you, how do you figure out where that point is, right? Mm. You know, so Isabel does this video where she says, we're actually in a silent depression. Well, she's hitting on a, a, a very real sentiment is what it is. Even right. though the information is factually wrong, the sentiment is 100% correct. It's the, the Richmond song, right? It is the sentiment that, look, everything has gotten more expensive. Everything's 30% more expensive now over the last few years. It is more expensive for housing, for rent, for a mortgage, for your credit cards, for your car, for groceries. So she's hitting on something that's accurate. Unfortunately, the question is, how, how do we fix that as an individual, like practically? It's right? mental. It's not yeah. completely, hmm. but... Uh, I'll mm. give you an example. There was a okay. story I read where a kid had a genetic disease okay. for which there is a cure. The cure is an expensive uh, gene therapy. It costs a million dollars. The family demanded the state pay for it. The state said, we can't pay a million dollars for one person's treatment. Yeah. If that treatment did not exist, there's no complaint. Right. There's simply right. grief and fear. Right. Now a treatment exists and there's hope. Uh. And with that hope comes the demand that it be paid for because we can. So I take a look at modern healthcare costs okay. and they talk about the treatments that people should get, the medication they should get. Mm. Not to mention a lot of this, I think is BS, weird mental drugs. But outside of that, mm. when these treatments did not exist at all. You mean like over diagnoses of well, disorders? Well, as, as, as a separate issue, you have people who are on all sorts of medical, mental prescription stuff right, 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 for right, our right. social Causing animals. more problems than right. helping potentially. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, I understand. But there are, there are um, you know, treatments for diseases today that did not exist a hundred years ago. And so when you got the consumption, yeah. you died terminal yeah. Yeah. and there was no complaining about what you were owed right. or your medical bills because it didn't exist. Right. 
Now that the treatments exist and they're hard to produce and they're expensive, yeah. there's a demand we get them for free. Interesting. Which creates a weird circumstance. If we were to today strip away all of the cures and all the medical advances from these from these diseases, and we just said we simply cannot cure any of these diseases, there's no left wing outrage over medical care. Interesting. It simply does not exist. But they do exist. So what do we do? And and that's where it gets interesting. Yeah. I this, this, this is where when it comes to like universal health care, this right. is where I'm like basic health care. I think I agree with. Yeah. I don't, you're a Bernie guy. Eh? Well, I used to be. Okay. 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 But not. His healthcare stuff's nuts. Okay. He wants it to go to an extreme that no other country wants to go to. Got it. But my view is always, if you get the flu, if you break your bone, uh, I think that that's the basic level of coverage that we provide. Okay. I, I, it's horrible when you hear about like a seven-year-old kid who got the flu and died. Right. And it's like, are you kidding me? We can treat this stuff with fluids and put them in the hospital and they live. But because of the expense, but then you get cancers, really advanced uh, uh, terminal diseases that are beyond the scope of- Basic healthcare. Right. And then how do you how do you take care? We can't give everyone the cure for this. We can't give everyone this million dollar treatment. Yeah. But if people know it exists and people don't want to die and I can respect them not wanting to die, that of makes course. sense. Yeah. Knowing it exists means mm. I need to get it. Yeah. So I'm not saying people are wrong for wanting the access to these things. But it, if you look at it holistically, if you zoom out and you look at humanity outside of the perspective of an, 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 a sympathetic individual, empathetic human being, you say, well, if we have 100 doses of cure and 10,000 people who would like cure, universal healthcare does not exist. It is impossible. Hmm, right. So how do you how do you do it? Right. I mean, it's it's like everybody would like to live in Los Angeles, but it's so expensive. Not everybody can. And then there's this idea, well, then we should have more affordable housing because I'm owed to live in L.A. Right. When the reality is, no, you're not. You need to leave L.A. So there's so that's outside, capitalism versus, you know, utopianism. Yes, know. yes. Yes. You know. Outside of the practical questions of how do you distribute cures? Right. You have the issue of perception and happiness. Uh, the view that we happiness are, is always fleeting, though. I think that there's right. almost this belief that everybody should be happy all the time. It's, it's people, people in the 1700s uh, who had no air conditioning and lived in Florida were happy. <laughs> Why Florida? Because <laughs> they well they built a they built a statue to the guy who invented air conditioning in Florida. Oh, okay. I grew up in Florida, so that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> I couldn't imagine living in Miami without AC. It's nuts. It's impossible. You you go <laughs> from it, AC to AC basically when right. you're in Florida. All yeah. the windows are drenched with humidity. <laughs> uh, but but they did for generations. Like yeah, that's interesting. Hundreds of years, that's and then point. now it's like, oh, well, we got to have AC. People yeah, will yeah. die without it. Oh yeah. Now think that isn't that crazy? Uh, that is people people who didn't have heat or AC before would just die. And it was a normal part of life. Now that we have the technology, it's a requirement. Yeah, true. It's, it costs money to make, it costs money to build, it costs money to implement. And to run. <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> so I, I wonder I wonder now if the reason we feel like we actually are in a depression uh, is because the amount of things we expect to have have uh, massively increased. Oh, our expectations are so much higher. Because but, of social media, maybe? But they're but they're partially necessities. Well, yeah. If you're yeah. if you're elderly, you need AC. Yeah, that's true. But when we didn't have AC, the elderly would just die. Uh, or we that. or we'd have different social customs for protecting them, like watering holes or making sure they were, you know, people would check in on them. Now that we're in the era of ubiquitous air conditioning, it's something we must have yeah. to live. Yeah. And the people who do have access to it live. Uh, a better example would be refrigeration. Okay. When nobody had refrigeration, if people would just die of diabetes. Uh, it was it was an illness that would affect kids and, and older people and they would just die. And then someone finally, I can't, I, remember, I read the story a while ago, isolated insulin and then all of a sudden the children were cured. Sure. And it was like, wow. So you could keep insulin at home. You got to refrigerate it. Yeah. So going back to what Isabel saying about the salary being 54K, mm -hmm. that's double the depression era. Right. But we also got to consider what we expect to be a, a necessity for us, including yeah. refrigeration, clean running water, yeah. sewage, Cell all of that phone, stuff. phone, internet. Yep. Yeah. Can you, wow. can you live in society and have a job and make $54,000 a year if you don't have a cell phone, don't have the internet, don't have air conditioning, and don't have clean running water? I, I, I think if, if you're making 54K, your goal should be, how can I make more? Yeah. Uh, and, but then you go back to, well, high school, and it's like, well, what did I learn? That's tough. Yeah. That's a problem. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Why, that's why I stopped going. Oh, no, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, you know, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm told everything will be different in high school. Sure. And then it's just, here's an interrogative sentence. And I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, the same, yeah. same garbage. And I'm just like, tell me one time I'll remember. Can we move on? Can we learn? No, nah, it was just a waste of time. So what do you think then about AI? Do you think we're going to go with AI towards more of this uh, displacement, more homelessness? 
Yes. Yeah. But I wonder if we will all live in the pods, own nothing and be happy. Oh, interesting. Okay, you yeah. will own nothing and be happy. That's a pretty common thing on social right now. Have you yes. seen... Uh, Rent everything. <laughs> I went to a GameStop just the other day. Why? Uh, I went to the eye doctor. Okay. GameStop was next door. Okay, well, that's fair. Yeah. I used to go and to midnight releases at GameStop, and I applied to GameStop to work there like 17 times, and they rejected me. Every time. <laughs> Why would you go to GameStop? That's a good question, actually. <laughs> Uh, as an aside, I think GameStop should be doing more to create community. Yes. And that's their path to, to monetization. Yes. Selling games. Come on. Should but, partner uh, with Dave and Busters. GameStop's and every Dave and Busters entertainment. That's a good idea, game. actually. Yeah. But it, but I think for GameStop, it's more of, it's it's less about selling a product and more about selling the space. Oh, 100%. What, like, I used to do GameStop competitions. Like I'd go to do Call of Duty competitions exactly. at the GameStop. They should have gaming tables, yeah. card games, exactly. they have Pokemon cards. They should have video game contests. Yep. But anyway, I digress. Mm. Uh, I was talking to the guy. There is a new chat GPT mod for Skyrim. Oh no, yes. You okay. can talk to, all the to, to your, uh, uh, not, not to all of them. I think it's a, com a companion. Okay, okay, okay. You can literally, my understanding, I could be wrong, but it's like you could put on a headset and as you're playing, you can say your companion's name is like John. You can be like, John, uh, come with me. And he'll go, you got it. And then you can say something like, John, what do you think about the current phase of the moon? And you can say, you know, I haven't thought too much about it. It's a, a natural wow. predictive response. And uh, the guy there was telling me that he played it and you can actually bump into the character and they will give you a unique, hey, knock it off. Wow. You keep hitting me, stop hitting me. And you're just, it's, it's incredible. As life gets depressing for so many people oh, yeah, and social interaction becomes harder. Yeah, I think there's a loneliness epidemic. The wealth inequality is going to be the owner class yep. and the VR gamer class. Oh. People who are poor and own nothing will have a small pod which could could technically be like a bachelor style apartment yeah. where they strap into VR and live in a world where they can be happy and mm -hmm. have everything they've ever wanted and feel emotionally satisfied. And that's wow. and that's how you placate a distressed populace. Now, then then I wonder, though, is that like so? I mean, it's very Ready Player One esque is I mean, it to some extent sounds very depressing because it's like, well, we, we shouldn't need that. But then on the other hand, does that take away the hardship that you would otherwise have in life? in any level of life i don't know yes like, hardship is good yeah Par all, i see all these parents they're like my kid will never be poor uh, i'm like that's a mistake yeah yeah uh, failure is a good thing failure is a good thing yeah. and it is really funny when you think about the the philosophy of it people people assume it's bad to fail yeah it's good to fail absolutely yeah it's like the path of success is through failure 100 percent. if your kids never experience failure what do you get Oh my gosh, you get a Brad spoiled, expect high expectation. Oh, there's the expectations word. Yeah. Wow. It's that's funny. It's almost what, like so I have a an eight year old now. He just had a birthday yesterday and uh, and a five year old. And when they play Roblox and it's just constant dopamine, dopamine, dopamine of of positive, 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 positive. Everything else in their life is miserable. Yep. Like getting up is miserable, going to the bathroom is miserable, going on a walk, getting on go karts, going on your bike, everything is miserable. So we took away Roblox. Good. Now they draw <laughs> <laughs> and they're happy and we wrestle and we play. Yep. It's insane. The scary thing with Roblox is, I shouldn't single them out. The scary things with kids playing video games yes, yes, is yes. the predators who go on. And when you're not paying attention, you think yeah. the kid's just playing a video game. Sure. You got some creepo whispering in their ear. <gasps> oh, yeah. I don't uh, think yep. about that. You're right. Oh, my gosh. So that's been a big thing. So how long until we get pods? Or, or is there a way to economically uh, to, to solve this, solve this, this silent depression that may or may not exist? Pods are coming, man. Yeah. We mm -hmm. got the, um, we got one of those VR treadmills. Okay. Just, just like last week. We haven't yeah. set it up yet. You, you, it's a bowl you stand on, you put on special shoes, you strap yourself to a harness, which is mounted as part of the uh, thing. And then you can run in any direction, strapped oh in, gosh. put the VR goggles on, take the controllers and you can play Skyrim. Uh, imagine what's going to be like when we have VR multi MMO, like World of Warcraft VR, and you're in oh, one yeah. of these things. And it's 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 out of movies, but I already look at a lot of these MMORPGs, especially with how big World of Warcraft is, oh, and yeah. it's constant dopamine, it's addiction. Oh my gosh! It's, it's funny. It's funny when you see these like farming simulator. Yeah. We had a uh, uh, we we're we're talking about how how much we want to do short films, sci-fi, dystopian stuff here, and we yeah. just like aren't getting around to it. So it'll probably never happen, but. I, we can dream, sure. but one of the ideas we had is because we constantly talk about this is uh, imagine a show where it's short film. This guy is talking with his friends about how they're going to win the uh, 
sim contest, okay. this video game. And then you get scenes of someone being like last year's champion, $10,000 prize, first place, video game champions. And they're practicing. And the game they're playing is Farming Simulator because it's a strategic game. It's where like Farmville? Yeah, well, there's, they have Farming far, Farm Simulator 22 just came out. Oh, interesting. Okay. I right, 22. Wow. People love this game. Wow. And they have Police Simulator. But so these guys are like, they're working on how they can maximize the, the game strategy so that the game is played over a few days and then they have the highest revenue and they have the lowest costs and they have the maximum produce. And then you see this big tournament where you have all these different teams wow. and there's TV screens playing the simulator and everyone's cheering and they're like, you know, you know, the, 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 the Phoenixes out of Detroit have generated 2.7 million already on their sim and they are leading the pack. And then you've got people like coming in sponsors being like, guys, you got to pick it up. Have you considered to, to there's like another team that's losing? And then the reveal is it shows an actual farm being operated by AI, which the video game players are actually controlling. Wow. They're doing the labor for free. Yeah. Sure. Not realizing it. So it's like uh, CAPTCHA, right? Uh, yeah. People don't. A lot You're of people training in AI by doing that every time. CAPTCHA has always been this. Yeah. So the first CAPTCHAs were the text that were weird looking. Yeah. I hate these things. You know what that was? It was they scanned a book <sighs> and the text was weird looking oh, and computers shit. couldn't recognize it, but humans could. <laughs> So when it was like, in order to proceed, what they would do is one word would be intentionally obfuscated that the yeah. computer knew, yeah. and one would be from a book the computer couldn't understand. And so you would then type in both words and teach the AI how to see letters that it couldn't understand. So you were doing free labor. <laughs> Imagine the, the greater wow. you know, extension of this. People playing video games like a simulator thinking that it's just a game, but they're actually running the farm and making profits for the owner of the farm. Mm. I mean, imagine that you, you talk about there's going to be the owners and the non-owners. Oh, yeah. Imagine if someone created, you know, uh, Burger Chain Sim. Sure. And they send out all these apps or people download the apps. And then there's like a wait list. It's like, when do you get to play the game? And someone finally gets like, your account has been activated. And what really happened is a new chain opened up oh. and someone has to manage it. <laughs> <laughs> and so then these people playing you know, the game are actually. What this relates back to is your message earlier of that purpose which is the back to vivek's message in playing those com competitive games you've now given folks a purpose whereas yeah. maybe now because of you know this this silent depression idea it's a it's this feeling of this lack of purpose and maybe games i mean i remember when i played world of warcraft i felt like i had a purpose i had to be there for my clan i had to heal or in, in pvp yeah. i had to heal i had a job i think a component of it might be that a couple generations ago your purpose was your family yeah People were like, get married, have kids, and then you're there for your kids. So everything you do is in service of having a family and raising those kids. Now, these people who are upset don't have kids. Not all of them. Some of them do. What do you think about that? Declining birth rates, declining want for children? Man, I don't know. Um, I, think it's, uh, I, I think it's catastrophic. Yeah. I, I think cities are too dense. Oh, and for sure. <laughs> right. This is, this, is, this is the overpopulation question. I, I say... There's no overpopulation here. Right. <laughs> There's uh, lots of land in the country. and But 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 maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the thing about... Here's the way I put it. We got chickens outside. Yes, you do. <laughs> they wake if you up at 4 a.m. They, they, they're, they're yelling. That's what they do. <laughs> they, they like to scream. But if uh, you have chickens out in the field yeah. and they poop all over the place, yeah. it's really good. Sure, the, it's fertilizer. It fertilizes. And then we have this, uh, we have this big patch of dirt yeah. from the old chicken city that just... And the, the plants grow like crazy. That's why you wanted the septic leach field where you were growing your vegetables. That sounds mm. nasty. but No, you don't actually. What? Yeah, septic leach oh, field. You somebody can't, told me the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, you don't want to grow on uh, leach. Probably, but, but every, like all the grass and chemicals everything grows go, well. It does. Oh, but, oh, chemicals, but that's different. So I'm thinking like cesspool days where there are no chemicals. Right. The, the septic stuff these days. No, today is bad. People, I'm not, like the old school just like. You know, poop and urine, right. and then it fertilizes as it percolates spreads and spreads out. Yeah, but yeah, what yeah. happens yeah. if you take all of the chicken yeah. crap yeah. and put it in one spot? Oh well, that's too concentrated. It's exactly, poisonous. The you, rain will kill the it plants. Away. Yeah, everything dies. Sure. It smells horrible, yeah. and people avoid it. That's a city. Ah, look at that! How interesting. Yeah. That's why we can always test COVID in those sewers, I guess. <laughs> I mean, there, uh, it, yes, it's too hyper. It's a hyper concentration of waste yeah. that can't be properly dissipated into the environment. So if people move away from these cities, then, but then you, can, so you much, can manage it. There's so much like, 
pooping on urban sprawl. Like, oh, we don't want urban sprawl. It yeah. takes away the character of a city in a downtown. But isn't to some extent kind of what people need is their own house and their yard and there's your school and your fire department, and your police station. I mean, we should dissuade people from moving to cities. I totally agree. Remote work is good. Yeah, sure. If you took all the people from the cities and spread them out yeah. over like an acre or so, or maybe you might mean you might need a couple acres, yeah. two or three. They could have their own septic system in Leachfield. Interesting. Then you've solved a lot of the human waste problem. Like in Chicago, they dump the sewage into the lake. Oh, wow. Then people swim in the water and get sick. Yeah, sure. Because what are they so going to do? So concentrated, like you said. Oh, it's insane That's if you nasty. think about it. 10 million people in the metro. You got 2 million, 2.5 or whatever in the city. Go to the beach and look at all those buildings. You have to ask yourself, where does that poo go? Uh, <laughs> that's nasty. That yeah. is interesting, the concentration. I mean, and the way you could also solve that is better commuting because, you know, highways and traffic are just a disaster. I really like the Elon tunnels because of that. Right. And, you know, because then you could have, you know, master planned communities outside of cities that are actually affordable and functional for you to have a family in at an affordable price. And if you need to go into a city to commute, you could do so in the tunnel. <laughs> Those tunnels are scary, though. Yeah, well, that's the other thing is, I mean, we're so unfamiliar with tunnels, right? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, I watched that video of the the, the, the tunnel that it's it's in LA, right? Uh, the first test for the boring tunnel. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Super single lane, one direction only. Right. Yes. Like, yes. What, it's just a capsule, man. And what if you get, yeah, like what if you get jammed in there and you're just like, <laughs> what do you mean? Full self-driving never has problems. I don't want to get that. Man. <laughs> that sounds scary. Do you have a Tesla? Yeah. Okay. Which one do you have? Uh, I have a uh, Model S and a three. Would you get the Cybertruck? Yes. Do you like Elon? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, do you like Elon? Oh yeah. 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 He's a cool dude. Uh, nobody's perfect. It's always weird when you're like, wow, Elon's doing some great stuff. And then someone's like, yeah, well look at the bad thing. And I'm like, that's true. He did a bad thing. Like, sure. There you go. <laughs> well, everybody's got something that they've right. done wrong. Nobody's an angel and perfect. Yeah. We have, uh, I don't, I, I love and hate the full self-driving. Okay. It's nearly killed me. Oh no. Yeah. Wow. How long ago? Uh, it's been, it's been a while since we've actually had any issues with it. Okay. So it's um, gotten better is what you're saying. It's absolutely gotten better, but okay. we've had some scary moments. It almost, it tried to swerve me into oncoming traffic once. Is this on like the one way roads? So right. Double yellow line. Yes. And it tried to jump into the other side. Now I'm holding the wheel. Oh. I don't do that stupid. There's so many dumb people that will put the, they put weights. You can oh, buy yeah, weights. You gotta be very careful. Yeah, I'm not doing yeah. that. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, we had one where. Uh, I would say maybe four or five times it slammed its brakes on full stop yeah. in the middle of the highway going <laughs> 65 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. Jeez. And uh, that's terrifying. Yeah, it is. One, one time what happened was two, 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 two circumstances. Uh, there For a while, it's, I think they fixed this. There is a, so this is funny. The street light ahead signs, it would think were street lights and it would start to break, but it would break normally. Okay. And that's kind of funny. Yeah. But then we had... A street light ahead sign with yellow flashing lights, uh, and as soon as it would, we'd come up the hill and see it. It would slam the brakes on. Oh wow! And I'd, I'd have, but I'm aware of it, so I tap the brakes. Then there was one. This probably the scariest outside of it trying to swerve into the oncoming traffic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's peak scary. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm like, I have my Ooh. arms firm to not let it. I'll let it go to the right, and it, you know. I'll, but it's only happened a handful of times. There's um like a like an eight lane highway okay. somewhere over here it's oh. four going one way four going the other Three. and there is a turn median in the middle for u-turns okay and for cops um, only or for everyone everyone okay okay, okay. so if you're trying it's a crazy it's a crazy road <laughs> if you it might be three on each side i don't know about four but if you're trying to come out of the neighborhood and cross and then turn left oof it's kind of nuts yeah. so what you do is you pull out you stop in the median of course a truck did that we were we had uh there was the le the left lane and we were in the middle lane. Oh, I know. And as soon as the Tesla on the screen saw it, it slammed the brakes on full stop. And we're like, we sh lunge forward like, and then I, you got to tap the gas to make it stop. Exactly. I'm like, oh, we are lucky we didn't get rear-ended. Sure. Oh, yeah. And, oh, but yeah. you know what it does now is a prompt pops up and says, tell us what happened. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you yeah. press the, the button and then you're like, explain it and I'm, I'm, I'm just like hey elon how's it going uh love the car it's been great it just tried to drive into oncoming traffic again you know we took control it's okay how long ago was the last time you've had this issue yeah it's been like six months okay yeah okay. so so you think the latest updates are helping i guess okay i haven't had any issues it's been okay. it's been pretty good do you actually drive much though uh i mean well yeah we're in we're in uh you know, we're in the tri-state West, West Virginia area. It's a lot of driving. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Okay. 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 But uh, let's clarify. Yeah. Do I drive much in, am I often in a car driving to places? The answer is yes. Am I the one behind the wheel uh, often? 
No. Yeah. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm usually in the passenger seat, okay. you know, doing something. Yeah, that makes sense. That but makes yeah, sense. yeah, it, it is curious to see the automation of everything and ultimately where where it leads us, especially politically. Uh, you mentioned that wealth inequality is going to get a lot worse. Way worse. My view is that leads to political instability. Hundred percent. But I'm curious, what's like if if you think it's going to get worse, like what do you what do you think the next year looks like, or or what happens? Well. I think that uh, California might be one of the first places to actually break if they keep going down this path. Uh, I'm I'm not very, I, I find myself generally to be pretty moderate and and not super conspiratorial, but I think that if there were one place to have a revolution, it would be California. <laughs> yeah, and it, it I almost disagree. needs one. Okay, so but but not yet. Almost it, it like no 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 it needs it, but it's not going to happen until that San Francisco problem spreads everywhere. When that happens everywhere in California, it's revolution. I mean, Sacramento's got it pretty bad too. But well, yes, I mean, San LA, Santa Monica, San Francisco, San Diego's better, right? But but it's still not ubiquitous enough. But I think yeah. that's where you get your first break is California. And I don't think America is ready for uh, a a like California governor becoming president. But it would be very interesting to see how a Newsom versus Biden would go. That would be interesting. Newsom wins. I know that's that's that I, I actually think that could happen. There, there, there is one thing that I think could stop Newsom from winning. And it's that if during the bait, his uh, uh, his fake human mask falls off and re <laughs> reveals the lizard man behind his it. robot. <laughs> yeah, the robots exposed. <laughs> right, right. So short of that happening. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. But as uh, otherwise, as far as the next year. Um, yeah, it's a uh, you know, I think. The, the best thing for an individual listening, your audience, uh, maybe they, they might not know me, is I, I think to myself, do what you can over this next year, two years uh, to provide as much, to create as much value in your life as possible because you need to get on the roller coaster. Not going to say it's going to be easy. Yeah. Nah, it's not for everybody. But if you're not on the roller coaster, you're going to get left behind. And so figure out how can I get a license? How can I get a better education? If it's not building your resume, stop doing it. If we get to that point of uh, if, if wealth inequality expands, it and will, I think yeah. and it, it, absolutely with AI, no question. Like we're, to, to, for example, somebody opens a new chain restaurant, a fast food restaurant, and they have only seven employees instead of the typical 40. Yes. Now you've got people with no jobs. That person who owns it is making more money. Mm -hmm. That's effectively transferring money from the poor straight into the pockets of the of the ultra wealthy at a faster rate. I mean, and theoretically, prices of the food should come down. But yes, there'll be more profit too. I don't think the prices will come down. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. They're gonna yeah. they're gonna be looking at it like everybody knows a burger's a buck. <laughs> I've cut true. I've cut my costs. Yeah, the burger stays a buck. I I'm just like, make more money. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, then, and and that's the other thing too. It's like I think people are looking for inflation to come down. It's not going to come down. Who right. are like, oh, you know, inflation, like, how is inflation going to get better? The prices are so expensive, they're supposed to come down. No, that's actually the job of the Fed is to make sure we keep having inflation. The job yep. of the Fed is to make sure we stay at 2%. If they wanted prices to come down, the job would be to go negative. Right. So then I wonder if there's a scenario in the next year or two where the have-nots go to war with the haves. Maybe not in a <sighs> year, but if we get to this point where you have an owner class it's depressing. that's on the roller coaster. Yes. And the people who missed the, uh, you know, they were either waiting in line for the roller coaster and they didn't make the cut. Yep. Oh. Yeah, those people aren't going to just say, I guess I lose. They're going to say, nah, I'll figure out another way to win. And that's mm. going to be revolution. Yeah. That's almost like Vivek style. Uh, yeah, interesting. I agree with you. Uh, or pod or give me pod. Pod living. You will own nothing. You'll be happy. I, well, we're trending in that direction. And, and so it's, it's, it's I don't know when it'll happen. Yeah, that's true. I don't know when, but I think we're slowly going to come more and more into that. Uh, there's there's so much hope. Like, for example, I'll put it this way. If somebody wanted to start a YouTube channel, so if was watching your, your videos right now or the live or however, they wanted to start a YouTube channel. If you want to get a lot of views right now, just tell everybody the market's going to crash. Right. Tell everybody there's going to be this great, glorious reset. And you're going to have your chance <laughs> to buy that gorgeous $100,000 four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath with a pool. And you're going to be okay. And you're going to get rich in the stock market. But it's all going to happen after this giant crash and after all yeah. the suits go to hell. That That is how to get a lot of views right now because it's echoing the sentiment of really Richmond and North Virginia, the political corruption, all of that. The question is, is that actually going to drive uh, meaningful change? How many of these anti-Richmond, North of Richmond people yeah. do you think would join the Richmond, North of Richmond the moment they got the opportunity? They would in a heartbeat. 
like do you think most people or every single person would every single person would 100 percent. and that's 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 sad to think though you know? uh, well yes uh because but why I, 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 I so there i guess there are two ways to look at it there's there's the way to look at it of um the the you know the politicians all the politicians are corrupt all the rich corporatists are corrupt uh and then there's the well if you started uh if a startup and it became a billion dollar company now you're a rich corporatist did you get there on bad intentions maybe not maybe you actually had a good product and like only fans capital right capital i mean he just made like 300 400 million dollars in the last year cashed out in options or whatever uh that guy's like killing it uh, but anyway so is he a bad person because now he has hundreds of millions of dollars and he's way richer than the next you know uh you know ten thousand people next to him he's, right? he's the alfred nobel of our generation uh i don't know that reference which is probably bad he, uh nobel he made, I think, dynamite TNT or something. Oh, interesting. Okay, and uh, yes. his vision for it was to help people who are in the mines. Yeah, sure. Right, exploration. Uh, you you plant the, the the explosives. You leave. You blow them up. Exactly. Nobody gets crushed or anything. Exactly. His obituary was published early by accident, and they <sighs> called him the Merchant of Death. Uh, he got so shocked by that he created the Nobel Prize so that he would be remembered for something different. <laughs> oh, that's that's see, that's so brilliant. Yeah. The OnlyFans guy tried to stop. <sighs> the pornography on the platform and no they weren't having it the users i guess the investors and so now they, you're the mecca of it <laughs> now you are the preeminent digital prostitution ring yes, yes. and right. this guy is going to be like we just wanted to make it so that musicians could be with their fans and their fans could help support them and now you are the king daddy pimp well i think it goes back to the what is it uh um power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely uh, <laughs> well, so the so the the, the challenge there is, I, I I'd be willing to bet that if you went to the dude who founded OnlyFans uh -huh. and you tried to shame him over being a porn ring, he would absolutely defend it. Of course, he's going to say all this stuff like people have a right to purchase. I'm libertarian, but deep down inside, he's just like I have to maintain because I, I I feel like if you watch your creation become this monster, you try to stop. Yeah, you're honestly going to you know deep inside be like, oh, yeah. here's the question. Is he a bad guy for allowing it to happen? Right. If he if he did a full stop and said, I will never allow this to take place, this is destructive to our to our culture, to our economy, we can't have it, yeah. they just remove him. Yeah, that's true. And Indeed. so does he just say, then cash me out, I'm done. Yeah. And then do we get mad at him for having done it? Yeah. That's true. Well, yeah, ultimately then the question is, so what's his job as a CEO? It's to make money for shareholders and investors. Yeah. And that answer is you lean into that kind of stuff. So then Oof. the question is, okay, what's the job of a politician? Well, it's to get reelected. Well, how are you going to get reelected? Are you going to get reelected by, uh, you know, going out and and, uh, and and helping people who aren't donating to your campaign or the people who are donating millions of dollars to your campaign because that's how you stay in your job? So, of course, yep. you know, it, it's... it's when when we go to the to the nitty gritty of it, every corporatist is like, well, I got I need more earnings for my company, so we gotta keep prices high and lower expenses, which means laying people off. You know, now we're talking about instead of silent quitting, we're talking about silent layoffs, which is where you know if Amazon doesn't want to fire you because of the PR of that, they assign you to a department that you don't want to work in, and then you quit, and then they don't replace you. Right. So now that the executives are doing what's good for the shareholder, which is more earnings, but then that's bad for the individuals because they're getting yeah. laid off. But everybody would probably do that in that situation. Yep. That, that, that's, that's the thing. You know, people complain about the CEO. They say, insert company, insert CEO. And I'm like, you remove that CEO. They're replaced in two seconds. Oh, uh, of course. And, and yeah. nobody thinks they're the villain. Everyone thinks they're doing the right thing. Yeah. I remember watching this uh, video where like uh, anti oil protesters went to the, like a CEO's home oh. and he came out. And they were pro he came out, sat down with them and said, tell me what we should do. Yeah. And then they had a conversation and he said, I agree with everything you've said. Yeah. And they were like, well, then why are you doing it? And he was like, OK, well, I would like to do the thing, everything you said. But then he starts pointing out, like, how many people would die if we reduce oil, like production into this city? How much energy loss would result in how much death? And it was just constantly yeah. like, we want to save the world. If we reduce oil production, 40,000 people will die in a month. Oh, we're screwed. Yeah. It's just, it's, yeah. it's really interesting because people don't make that direct correlation. Of course. That, you know, like Greta Thunberg says, we want to shut down all fossil fuels oh my God. by 2023 or whatever. Right. Yeah, okay, six, I think six million die in the first month or something like that. Yep. Uh, loss of power, air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And so there's a question of, we can't let people die. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep doing this. Look at California as an example in this. 
when I ran for governor, I uh, ran on more fracking, more wow. oil. I know. That pissed people off, right? Of course it did. <laughs> uh, so, but here's why. In California, we have uh, these rolling blackouts every summer. The electricity grid isn't stable. Part of the reason for that is we don't have enough natural gas peaker plants that are capable enough for the demands we have now. Okay, so you look at the natural gas peaker plants and you say, okay, well, why don't you make your systems better? And they say, we would love to. In fact, we're running 1970s technology and we'd love to have more efficient technology that could actually lower emissions. So we go to the state of California and go, can we please get a permit to have a more efficient facility? The state of California says, is it 100% green? Well, <laughs> no, but it's more green. Nope. nope. It's got to be 100% green. So you're left with the old crap and not the efficient crap. Yeah. So what you should have is the most efficient fossil fuel burning stuff that you can have now while trying to transition uh, to, to, yes, a more sustainable future, whether that's yep. nuclear or whatever. And then the activists celebrate their victory. Yes. They come out and they- We stop the peaker plant from expanding. Great. Enjoy yep. your blackouts. Enjoy your wildfires. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, this is, this, is, this is the harsh reality of, I suppose, how our system works. There are, I've worked at these environmental nonprofits. I don't think they actually care about anything. Oh, <gasps> Tell me more. Oh, I mean, come on. You know, the fa the starting of Greenpeace was save the whales. These nuclear tests are bad, uh, oh. you know, right? And so a very noble cause taking a boat, going to where they're going to blow up a nuclear bomb mm -hmm. and right, sitting the, there. the ocean test, ocean based nuclear tests. Exactly. Yes. And then uh, it just turns into, OK, how do we convince more people to give us more money? Mm -hmm. And now they oppose nuclear power plants. Sure. It's like, OK, well, nuclear power plants is green. Yeah. Nu nuclear energy is, is carbon neutral. Exactly. And, it, yeah. and it's got, a, I, think, I think it's the best energy return on energy invested. 100%. So why don't we have more of these? Well, now the complaint is where do you store it? And countries in Europe have figured this out. You just go, you know, 10 miles down into the- The waste products, you mean? Yeah, exactly. So you just go 10 miles down and you store it in a nuclear waste like facility, basically, that's just casing concrete and it's fine. But and the reality is the amount of nuclear waste, I believe, I get this right, the amount of nuclear waste that you would create your entire lifetime would fit inside this pen. Well, per human. Sorry. But I, I do think the uh, modern nuclear generate, uh, uh, the, the, the latest generation of nuclear tech is like 99.9% .9 recycled materials. Oh, yeah. Sure. And then thorium salt reactors are very promising. Oh, wow. Okay. And, but it's just maybe, th 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 this is why a lot of people don't believe in climate change. Or oh, I, I should clarify, the climate change agenda. Agenda. Well, I think that's, what, this, this, the nonprofitism, what you mentioned is you need basically more donations you need you need a something to fight against because if you can't if you don't have anything to fight against you don't get donations because you don't get attention yeah so the attention gets you donations nonprofits are funny because they are absolutely for profit because think about it nonprofits are just paying payrolls to everyone who's working there the ceos of some of the nonprofits are making half a million bucks a year or they're that. making or more Millions. they're making plenty of money the corporation is deemed nonprofit because you just keep reinvesting. But who cares? Everybody could start a nonprofit you know, and then pay yourself a fat salary. One of the clever moves that a lot of these nonprofits do mm. is you create a 501c3 and a 501c4. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, for those that aren't familiar, one is uh, the in, all the revenue streams are disclosed and it's tax deductible. One, it is not tax deductible and revenue streams are not disclosed. And so what they'll do is they will... Take the money into the 501c3. Uh -huh. Crap loads of money. Sure. But let's, let's call the 501c3, uh, let's call it the Foundation for Accepting Greatness into Our Hearts Foundation. <laughs> then you create a 501, uh, 501c4 called Fight for Trees. <laughs> you go out, you make your phone calls, and you say, I'm with Fight for Trees, and we would like donations from you. But when they fill out the form, the donation goes to... Whatever I said the first one. Yeah, 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 right? exactly. What they can do then is, or it, it might be the other way around too. However, yeah. Depending on, they, they might, I think a lot of them will, will have the money go to the 501c4 where they can obfuscate their revenue. Sure. And what they'll say is because we engage in politics and lobbying, it's not going to be tax deductible. <laughs> so, and they go, oh, okay, right, right. But if you want us to fight for this, then it's worth making the donation. Yeah. 
the 501c4 or like whatever whatever their front organization their their shadow organization is will make let's say 100 million dollars yeah. it will then donate to the front facing organization of course. 5 million uh, yeah. 5 million dollars sure. then when it comes to their fundraising they'll say we only brought in 5 million dollars last year and they can get away with it yep Man, I, I used to work with these nonprofits and I was just like, these people are it's, evil. A, a lot of it is just a game. And I think that's, it's an interesting message that Vivek, for example, is hitting on. It's, it's you know, the climate change ag agenda is killing more people than climate change. I, I think it's a little extreme what he's saying because I, I don't know how the agenda is killing people. But from a sentiment point of view, the sentiment is killing me on the inside because it's just like, it's I think he's disaster right. Disaster the way it's set up. It's I, I think he's right, and you got to look but at what it. What does he mean with killing people? Like so economically, they're stealing from people. I think is the better answer. <laughs> so the, well, so the question is, yeah. if the economy declines by yeah. X percent, yes, what is the correlated amount of death from economic uh, downturn? Interesting. Okay, okay, because of the inflation that you create by supporting these projects that aren't fruitful, and therefore now you go into a recession potentially, and that leads to death because you've lost your job, you turn homeless, you get afflicted with drugs, and you die. Okay, interesting. Wow. Various things like that, or or you know, yeah. someone gets sick and they can't afford their medicine. Someone right. is diabetic. They okay. Can't okay. Think. So it's 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 a long circuitous path. Yes. But if the issue is how many people die from discer discernible extreme weather events or extreme weather uh, that we can actually calculate versus how many people die from the economic ramifications, I think. I'm, I, I'm, I'll say this. I don't know if he's correct, but what he's saying yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Assuming it, it the seems data intuitive and that's, aligns. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's, it's, it is incredible. There's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot behind the scenes that would make a lot of folks go, oh my gosh, what is actually going on here? And it's sad, but from a practical point of view, I think there's little from an individual point of view we're going to do. I think from an individual point of view, everybody's goal needs to be, what can I do to get to, uh, to not be left behind? I think, People have to reject the the assumptions. Yeah, you know, and a lot of what I get out of our conversation so far is, especially with the way these companies are just operating, politicians won't change because they want to get reelected. So that means yep. the the what, what were the plants called that you were talking about? Oh, uh, uh, oh, the 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 peaker plants, peaker the natural plants, gas peaker. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are not going to get built though. They need to be because the politicians want to, want a, an, an environmental victory, would actually cause more environmental problems. And the only way anything changes is if a politician actually comes out and says. Guys, it's not good that we're not doing this. These are more efficient. We have to get from point A to point B. or We have to get from A to C, and that means stopping at B, and there's no other option. People have to just say it and break the system and be like, I'm not going to play that game. Yeah. But and as soon as you say that, the billions of dollars from those climate nonprofits go into ads going, all they want is oil. Yep. Don't vote for that person. Look what oil causes. Smokestack, death. <laughs> but you have to just do it. Uh, yes, yes. Because yes. then eventually there's no options, and everyone's just saying, I don't care what the ads are saying. <laughs> Like we're telling you, this is the yes. case. Like we yes. want to improve things. Truth is really missing a lot in our, our discourse. And I think that's why I, I strongly believe that 99% of Americans, whether they're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Authoritarian, whatever, they can sit together and probably agree on 99% of things. It, and I know right. it sounds extreme, but I really believe most people can sit down at a bar, have a realistic conversation and agree on a lot of priorities that we can focus on. Here's my view of the culture war and my experience, which I'm sure will get a lot of backlash from leftists and liberals. How do you deal with all that backlash? I don't ignore it. You do, okay. <laughs> I go to a bar okay. Okay, okay. and I sit down with a regular person Okay. and they'll say, I hate Donald Trump. And I'll be like, fair point. You're allowed to, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. And we'll talk and I'll say like, yo, look, you know, I don't like Joe Biden. And they'll be like, why? And I'll say, here are the legitimate reasons. I'll go, oh, okay. You ask the average person. I'm not talking about these these bits where people go to Times Square and find stupid people and ask them. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Well, it's but like, that's all cut out of context as well. I mean, that's you know, ten hours of filming thing. down to ten minutes of content, and it's the most dramatic stuff, of course. But, but that's YouTube. <laughs> you look at the political class of commentators, yeah. and what will you find in the anti-establishment wing? The majority is an honest conversation mm. with some grifters. Okay. Yeah. The other side is majority grifters and mm -hmm. sometimes some honest conversation. Okay. Wow. So. I, I, that that makes things untenable, I guess, and 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 makes me feel like we're headed towards an inevitable collision, because it's almost like uh, it's yin yang. Oh yeah, we're, we're looking into the face of what I would describe as uh, the banality of evil and abject evil. Yeah. Uh, example: Joe Biden and Burisma. Okay. Oh yeah, Hunter. Joe Biden's on camera saying, "If you don't fire the prosecutor, you're not getting the money." Yes. 
And I will speak to people who are liberal or leftist and say, that never happened. Mm, and I'm like, I'll, I'll be, I'm just going to get the video for you and play sure. it for you. And then you sure. can give me your opinion on it. Yeah. it. It is a pretty clear implication. Yeah. But you look at some of these prominent personalities and they'll either repeatedly deny its existence. It never happened. Sure. Knowingly lying or and that's the abject evil, yeah. the banality of evil in they just believe MSNBC and they won't actually Google search it. Oh, interesting. You. This, this has been my experience consist consistently since the culture war became, you know, front facing and dominant mainstream. I sit down with Trump supporters. Yeah. I was I, I sat down in San Francisco in like 2016 or whatever wow. with Trump supporters for this big dinner. And they were like, you know, come, 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 come. In. You know, we know that you're like a lefty guy. You like Bernie. But, you know, we want to talk. And I'm like, oh, I'm always interested to talk. Sure. And they started laughing about the idea of systemic racism. Uh -huh. And then. They were like, that's a lie. And I was like, I was like, no, I think it's real. Yeah. I just think it depends on who you're talking to and how it's being defined. And you got to make sure you got a clear understanding of what the what, what the phrase represents. Yeah. And so I explained to them basically how uh, Ferguson happened. Mm -hmm. the, the long story short is it was rooted in racial covenants, barring black people from moving to certain areas. Sure. Redlining. You know, yeah. Yeah, like red redlining was uh, 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 in Chicago. They said this area, the resident companies were like, this area is specifically where we're going to sell to black people. Mm -hmm. With Ferguson, you had Pruitt Igo, you had uh, government housing, mm -hmm. poverty, the yeah. welfare stuff didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so white people moved out of the cities where there was crime yeah. and then created small suburbs. Yes, St. Louis is now comprised of like 90 some odd suburbs. Yeah. It's not a big city. It's actually a whole bunch of small cities. Yeah. Then they passed uh, uh, covenant saying nobody can live here anymore. Like that's mm -hmm. it. No one's allowed to move in. Yeah. So what ends up happening is you have uh, lower income, a higher, a disproportionate amount of lower income people who are black for historical reasons. And when they can't, example, their tail light goes out and they don't know. Yeah. They're driving from their their home huh. to their place of work ten miles away, and they drive through four different cities. Yeah. You get pulled over. Pulled over four times. Yeah. And so what I said to these guys is. I am not saying any one of those cops are racist. Right. Those cops don't think they're racist. Those cops didn't pull that cover for being black. Mm -hmm. But there is a system in place that began in the civil, pre-civil rights era yeah. that created a disproportional racial impact. 100%. The Trump supporter guys go, oh. Oh, really interesting. And they're like, I see what you're saying, but I would disagree with the phrasing because it makes it seem like they're, I'm like, totally understand. Totally yeah, understand. Yeah, I guess when, when people hear uh, systemic, maybe, maybe they're not thinking of system uh, because really right. what you've described uh, is, is exactly true. It's, it's called the concentration of poverty. Yeah. So uh, when you are in poverty, you are twice as likely to either commit or be a victim of crime, Yeah. but you are also twice as likely to be a minority, specifically yeah. black. Or Hispanic in, in and, some cases. You know, so I so I tell these guys, I'm like, I don't think Trump supporters are racist. I don't think cops mm. are racist. I think there are racists. I think yeah. there are racist Trump supporters. Absolutely. But if you have this system that was built a long time ago and based on racial tension, yeah. that results in people who have less generational wealth, yeah. which disproportionately tend to be black. Absolutely. You will end up with more black people experiencing. They, what happens is they get pulled over four times. Oh, yeah. Then when they can't pay that bill, of course. they get arrested for it. Your license gets suspended and then you get arrested because you have to drive to work. Then you get uh, pulled over on a suspended license. You knew about yep. it. You go to jail. But here's the worst part. You get a you get a $50 ticket for a busted taillight. Yeah. You don't pay yeah. or your taillight went out. You didn't know. Yeah. You get you, you don't you don't pay it because you're like, I got to pay rent, food. It's poverty. Mm -hmm. Then the police show up and say, because you didn't pay a moving violation, yes. you're getting two days in jail. Yes. It's a it's a slap on the wrist. Then you lose your job. But when you get out on Monday. The next city's police department is waiting for you uh, because you owe them 50 bucks you didn't pay uh, because of the fractured system yes. of how there's so many different suburbs and yes. police jurisdictions. Yes. One violation turns into four. And so I'm like, now you need to understand how they're mm -hmm. perceiving it. They're yeah. perceiving black people are getting pulled over too much. Mm -hmm. I think it's a class issue and we should try and alleviate the race. But my mm -hmm. point ultimately is not to rehash that story. It's to point out that Trump supporters sat down, yeah. have no problem having that conversation. Of course. Listening to what I had to say, yeah. giving their thoughts on it, and then we all smile and eat, you know, cheeseburgers. Well, and, and that's ultimately, I think, what every reasonable American should be able to do is have that kind of discussion. And, and the reality is when you fall into poverty, the first thing people usually do is they have to move to a poorer area. Yeah. And then what's in a poor area? Well, the ERs are full, can't get medical attention. The schools are even lower quality. And then what happens? Your children can't get a good job. They can't go to college, whatever. And so then they have to move to a poor area and it just gets worse and worse and worse. It's terrible. And so ultimately what it, what it brings me to, the reason I bring the story up is we struggle to get 
prominent liberals and leftists to come on this or or, or Tim Kessler really? or any shows. They won't do it. Oh, that's unfortunate. Uh, one I have, thing I respect about Vivek is he goes on everything. Yeah, well, MSNBC, man. Yeah. And the line's done. <laughs> but, you know, there's a handful of uh, liberals and leftists that we're, we're, we're fans of, we like. You yeah. know, I always shout out uh, Crystal Ball and Kyle Kalinske. Okay. They're, they're good people. Okay. We disagree on like... Crystal Ball uh, from Breaking Points. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, she's, she's, she's great. Yeah. Disagree with her on a lot of things. What about um, but But she's a... Like she's an honest person, you can talk, and and Kyle Kalinsky as well. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, too many of these. Uh, uh, I, th I think the issue is if you bring in what, a, a prominent left personality yes. into an actual conversation like this, yeah. their entire framework is ripped to shreds, uh -huh. and not not for political reasons, for issues uh, matters of fact. Oh wow! Right. So like talking about Joe Biden and Rizzo, we had a guy come on Timcast IRL. And I mentioned, yeah, but Joe Biden said, you know, if you, he, uh, he's like, Trump did a quid pro quo. I'm like, yeah, so did Biden. Biden said, if you don't fire the prosecutor, you're not getting the billion dollars. Right. Vice president doesn't have the authority to withhold congressionally approved loan guarantees. And he smirks and goes, that never happened. Oh, okay. And I'm like, yeah. hey, we're live. I play the video for him. Oh. And then he's like, uh oh. So people, they don't want to come in here and know well, that. Well, because then you get ambushed uh, yeah. in that sense. Oh, that's really interesting. But see, that's a problem because then you can't have a real dialogue and then you can't actually figure out, well, what are the real grievances and what are the real solutions? And so then you get the extremism. Everybody stays on their own echo chamber, basically. And that's a real right. big issue because then hate goes up like exactly. we had on the chart. So uh, I got one last question for you. Please. Who are you going to vote for in 2024? Oh, man. You know, <laughs> so right? it, it actually really is. Uh, yeah, it, it, I really... I don't know that Joe Biden's going to make it to the election. I agree. Uh, I so, you know, I, uh, Biden versus Trump rematch. I, I I don't actually know that we're going to see that. Uh, I don't. I mean, Trump's not going to be done with any of his his uh, you know prosecutions or whatever. All those are going to probably continue throughout the entire election because even if he were found guilty, let's say in the Georgia thing, which is conveniently happening before Super Tuesday, but nobody you know that's obviously not planned. Um, being sarcastic, but anyway, um, any kind of sentencing or whatever, even if he were found guilty, wouldn't probably happen until after the election. So ultimately, mm -hmm. American voters are going to decide. I think you get Trump Vivek. If I had to decide today, you get a Trump Vivek. And you probably get uh, probably a Newsom. That would be very would you vote for interesting. Newsom? I ha I have like like I I don't want to say what I would do because I I don't even know because uh, let's put it this way I really hate what Newsom has done in California. <laughs> okay, and I don't want to see that happen to America. Right. I'll, I'll say that much. <laughs> and you don't want to vote for Trump. Uh, I I don't want so it, it, look if I if I say what I would vote for and I I honestly I don't think I could say it I think I I have to respect the as much of the impartiality that I try to provide to my channel yeah. because I truly believe I'm so fifty one forty nine let me put it this way do I really think the trajectory of America is going to substantially change whether it's Newsom or Trump or Vivek. Probably not. Yeah. Because of the way the system of government is set up, because our founding fathers really set up our republic to change very little. Yeah. You know, I, I, I absolutely can respect that. I think uh, abstaining is reasonable to me. Like, I'm not saying you're abstaining. That's I'm saying stuff. if someone came to me and said, dude, I don't want to vote for anybody, I'd be like, I get it. I get it. This is a disaster. It's all it, it all sucks. But I, I'll put it this way. I'll vote uh, and I will provide the, I will, I will always say, you know, the pros and cons on each side, but yeah. you know, I, 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 I don't want to be associated with a side, even though obviously yeah, right. I'm of a party, I don't have to commit to that party affiliation with how I vote. Well, I think that's good. Yeah. I think, uh, I think, you know, when you talk about how you like the things Vivek has said or, yeah. or in certain ways or whatever, yeah. I think we need as much as possible for people who uh you know people who wh wherever they find themselves especially people who aren't in like hardcore politics mm -hmm. what you're doing i think is fantastic just give mm -hmm. give people the opportunity not to have to put you in a camp and then you can talk to them and then they can try and make their make their own mind sure you know yeah. uh this has been a blast man it was really really awesome good conversation thank you so much you want to shout anything out 
Yeah, hey, uh, I'm Meet Kevin. You can follow me on uh, YouTube. I post about the economy, and uh, probably I'd say 70% of my videos are about stocks, the economy, the Fed, what's going on, uh, how things are changing. And then 30%, I add my political commentary, which my finance people are like, Kevin, stop talking politics. And I'm like, I actually, <laughs> I actually think it's important because I'm a big fan of trying to find that truth. And hey, like what we showed with the Isabel thing or whatever, like right. well, what's where's the truth? And really- yeah. Ultimately, I think everything comes to money at the end of the day because that helps everyone individually succeed. So I think yeah. it all relates to finance. So I'm a finance guy, but I'm going to add my perspective. <laughs> right on, man. It's been a blast. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you. Appreciate it. For, uh, for all the rest of you, uh, get tickets to our event in Miami. If you go to TimCast.com, the Miami event tickets are available right now. We got Patrick Bet David, Trump Jr., Matt Gates, me and Luke Rudkowski, as well as uh, Ian Crossland will be there. We got a pre-show. We got an after show. We look forward to seeing you there. You can follow me at TimCast everywhere. And uh, thanks for hanging out. We'll see you tonight at 8 p.m. at youtube.com slash timcastirl.